It's good to see you back on the uh, Global Star Party, David. I'm really glad you're back. Yeah, me too. I'm here, everyone, just getting set up. <laughs> Hello, Carlos. Hey, Carlos. <clears throat> We're all being so well behaved as we approach <laughs> the moment of truth. Well, we're being really quiet. We're not actually that well behaved. <laughs> no, <okay>. That's better. <laughs> Inside, it's busy, busy, busy. Hello, Maxi. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, David. Oh, well, Maxi, how are you doing, man? How are you, Maxi? Uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, coming back from holidays, well, vacations. Uh, last weekend so now starting to work again the start the the year again so but anyway doing astronomy and astrophotography like like always <laughs> yep i went in my vacations with my small gear and i uh, met with a friend that he also do astrophotography in near the beach you know and it was a really good view because we don't have any wind and and almost at midnight uh, in the horizon at the east starting go up the let's rise the moon now it was amazing and see some uh, big ships that they are going to the port then and it was a, a really view really good view so I, I enjoy it a lot. So, hey Molly, how are you? Yeah. Hey Hi, Molly. Molly. Molly, how are, how are you? How are you guys doing? Yeah, there's this, David, I wanted to tell you about this new contributing editor to Astronomy Magazine. <laughs> Astronomy Magazine? I thought you might even let me introduce the new contributing editor tonight, Scott. <laughs> I don't want to tell it anything. I, I'm not saying who it is, okay? I'm not saying who it is. We're very pleased to have Molly on the team. <laughs> yeah, I was glad to hear it. I, I thought that was fun to, to read about that. Right. So we got some people tuned in right now. Book Davies is tuning in from YouTube. Mostly everybody from YouTube. Uh, Book Davies, Dusty Haskins. Uh, you know, these two guys have been watching Global Star Party since we started it. And Mike Wiesner, another one. Uh, Dusty says, I keep telling my brother to stop in and see you guys and get me a shirt because he goes over to Bentonville three times a week to ride bike. Dusty, you got my phone number and you got my email. You want a shirt? 
contact me. We'll we'll work something out. Josh Kovac, howdy from Rainy, Michigan. Um, uh, Jim Mosley's watching. Hello from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Well, we've got a great program, you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> determine distances in the far reaches of the universe. A small galaxy close in looks similar to a large galaxy farther out. This is a real challenge that researchers have found several solutions for. One method uses something called a standard candle. A standard candle is a type of object or event that emits a specific known amount of light, allowing scientists to find its distance with a straightforward formula. This works because light sources appear predictably dimmer the farther they are from an observer. Since astronomers know how much light a standard candle gives off, they can determine its distance by measuring how dim it appears from Earth. Since only very bright objects or events are visible in the far reaches of the universe, the options for standard candles are limited. Some of the best and most reliable are exploding stars, called supernovae. There are a few different kinds of supernovae, but the best for standard candles are Type 1a. These supernovae involve a white dwarf, the leftover core of a dead star, and one other star in a binary system. Some of the time, it may be a white dwarf and a larger host star. Scientists think the white dwarf steadily accumulates material shed by the host star, gaining mass in the process. When it reaches a specific tipping point, the white dwarf has gained enough mass to trigger a runaway reaction at its core, and it explodes spectacularly, sending out an expanding sphere of super-hot material that glows from the energy of the explosion. In other cases, scientists think two white dwarf stars may form the binary. Either the stars finally merging together triggers the supernova, or it happens as they spiral in closer and closer, while the more massive of the two pulls material off its companion in the final few minutes. Before they merge, it reaches the same mass tipping point and goes supernova, always releasing a similar amount of energy. Because white dwarf explosions are all so similar, the energy and light output of Type 1a supernovae are easy to standardize. Type 1a supernovae are rare in any one galaxy, occurring only once every 500 years or so in the Milky Way. But because there are so many galaxies, astronomers using current telescopes observe Type 1a supernovae about 100 times a year. By comparing the observed brightness with the intrinsic brightness, astronomers can determine their distances within 6%. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope set to launch in the mid-2020s, will observe large patches of sky repeatedly, increasing the opportunities to spot these supernovae. Scientists predict Roman will see as many supernovae in one month as they've found in the last 20 years. Finding more of them will help astronomers refine the accuracy of this method, contribute to an improved three-dimensional map of the universe, and better understand how the universe has expanded and evolved throughout cosmic history.
Hey everybody, it's Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and you are watching the 111th Global Star Party uh, with our theme of Candles in the Dark. Um, I am uh, really pleased to have our lineup, as I always am. I, I genuinely get real excited about the uh, presentations and the people that come on Global Star Party, uh, as well as the audience. And, uh, you know, it gets, uh, it gets me charged up during the day. And um, so, uh, really, really pleased to have everybody here. Uh, we are going to start, as we have traditionally, with uh, my good friend David Levy, who uh, presents his thoughts on our Global Star Party and, uh, and gives us a nice poem. So, David, thanks for coming on to the 111th program. Thank you, Scott. And well, I'd like to add my welcome. And I, I'm sure this is going to be a wonderful Star Party, especially with Molly here and David and um, John and Maxie and Carlos. It's going to be a good star party we're going to have. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyway, I was um, thinking of Candle in the Dark and actually reminded me of Elton John's famous song, Candle in the Wind, I think it is, uh, that he wrote for Diana's, Princess Diana's funeral. And um, reminds me of a story that uh, Wendy and I were at my mother's unveiling of her tombstone, which is something that we do in the Jewish religion, but 11 months after the funeral. And we went out there, and of course, Wendy, who doesn't miss a thing, started to wander around a little bit. And then she stopped at one of the gravestones and she said, David, you got to get over here immediately. That particular gravestone couldn't have been more than 25 feet away from where Mum's stone was. And I got there, and the name on the stone was Leonard Cohen. Hmm. And wow. I, said, I like to imagine that. Leonard Cohen and my mom have become very good friends up there in heaven, where they are now welcoming Wendy. And I hope that she will join them as a friend. Anyway, um, candle in the dark. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to um, go back to someone who is very, very good with candles, Leonard Cohen himself. And uh, I'm going to do some cosmic variations on a theme by Leonard Cohen. It's time to go outdoors tonight. The sky is dark. Some stars are bright. The Milky Way shines overhead. Now see ya. A comet rises in the east. With end to strife, it brings us peace and calls us to a cosmic hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alleluia. Thank you, and back to you. Thank David. you so much, David. <laughs> I love it when you sing, dude. Thank Thanks. you. Well, okay. So um, only on global, only on global star party. It's awesome. Uh, we have um, coming up next, as uh, again, as tradition has been, when global star parties is to. Uh, talk a little bit about the Astronomical League and to bring on one of the executive officers uh, that uh, comes up with questions uh, to challenge our audience. Um, but uh, the Astronomical League is uh, still a quickly growing organization right now. Maybe the largest uh, uh, membership-based uh, group of amateur astronomers uh, with over 20,000 members. I think they're maybe up to 24,000 at this time. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement going on. And why is that? Because, well, we've had uh, uh, the pandemic itself uh, force people to go out in their backyards and look up. Um, but we've had some amazing things going on with uh, privatized space flight. Um, you know, there's a great comet in the sky right now with Comet E3. Uh, we've got a couple of eclipses coming up. So it's just many different aspects of why it's a good time to get involved in amateur astronomy but there's probably no better group to join uh, than the astronomical league with their over 80 observing programs their dozens of uh, 
of award programs that they have uh, and the world famous Alcon event, uh, which um, I think that David Levy will be going to uh, this year. I should be there as well. So it'll be in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, let's bring on John Goss from the Astronomical League. If I can yes, only... it would help if I unmuted myself, I realize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Um, yeah, I, I, I love listening to, to, to these talks. Uh, David is always interesting. He's always says something that um, relates to me. You know, he talks about Leonard, Leonard Cohen and he starts singing the hallelujah. You know, all that stuff is, is excellent, excellent stuff. And uh, th thank you for doing that. But let me jump into what I have prepared. Okie dokie. Um, da, 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 da. There we go. Um, Alcon 2023. Yes, as Scott was saying, is coming up in Louisiana. It's almost six months away still. Uh, the organizers are still assembling uh, more and more speakers all the time. As, um, as Scott mentioned, uh, uh, David Eicher is going to be there. Great. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for um, meandering down the Mississippi. Uh, from uh, Wisconsin area, uh, Fred es Espinac, uh, David Levy, uh, that'd be great. That would be great. We have some other people who you, you may not know of or know much about. Uh, Pranvera Hyseni is from Europe. I can't remember which country, but she is Kosovo. great in outreach. Pardon me? She's from Kosovo. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. Kosovo. And she's she's been to a, a number of these, but her expertise is traveling around engaging people in amateur astronomy, especially young young people. And we have another, another well, a number of other people which we're going to have um, speak at, at Alcon. As I said, all that is still being assembled. Uh, I hear about something weekly about, about this stuff. If you, have, if you want to know more about Alcon, alcon2023.org is where you want to go. Before we jump into my questions, I'd like to bring up something which is kind of kind of come come back to us during the questions uh the league is producing has produced uh, monthly star maps for the beginners and we have it uh well in english as well as spanish so we, you, you see the spanish one right there and these yes. are available <laughs> on our facebook page uh when our website gets fully functioning they will be all um stored there as well um, so we have these coming out every month. In fact, they, the, the February bash will be out in next next week. So we, we try to keep up with that. This is all all for beginner stuff, really, and how to find your way around the night sky. Find it very useful. We also have an, another batch of these things, which um, shows beginners, newcomers, uh, just some things about amateur astronomy, it's things about the night sky, things about the hobby. This was is, is on uh, magnification and field of view. Spanish, and we do have them in English too. But uh, again, these are on our Facebook page where uh, periodically they get posted. But it's for, uh, as I said, for newcomers to the hobby. Um, here's another one, Saturn, uh, a two pager for that. Uh, interesting uh, facets on how to observe Saturn, what, what the beginner is gonna see and what the beginner may, may not see. So it, this is all directed toward really a cer certain set of people. We're just starting something else now, and that's on double stars. Easy double stars. Well, I'll say easy double stars to find. But, you know, cast. this is the, the star caster. It's one of the brightest stars in the sky. And it's fairly easy to find this time of year. So this is a great chance to, to start your double star observing by uh, investigating what caster has to offer. A small telescope can see this. So this is something that, that, that we're doing on our Facebook page, and we will also um, um, introduce it to our website at a later, <clears throat> excuse me, at a later point. And as I said, a lot of these are in Spanish and English. Let's move on to our questions. Um, you know, we always like to caution people when they observe the sun um, for obvious reasons. That the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the full moon, so it doesn't take much time of looking at the sun before you do get permanent eye damage. So you got to make sure you have the correct solar filter placed on the front part of your telescope. Uh, and not have the telescope uh, pointed in any weird directions. Make sure that kids know what the deal is and no one messes around with it with the filter. But if it's done properly, it's a very rewarding object to study. In fact, I was looking at the sun yesterday, and right now, 
as we speak. This sun is uh, pretty active, and you can see a lot of really good stuff on it uh, when it <clears throat> excuse me when it rises tomorrow. Enough of that. Okay, well, let's go on for the answers from last week's questions. Number one, uh, Halley's comet. Excuse me, one moment. Halley's comet was famously captured in the 230 foot long cloth artwork produced shortly after the Battle of Hastings. In what city can you go to see it? Well, it's the Bayeux Tapestry. And I tell you, I'm not going to pronounce that French. La Tapisserie de Bayeux. <laughs> Enough of that. That's the answer for that one. Excuse me, all my French friends. <laughs> One more, I'm sorry. I'm having a problem here. Hmm. It will not advance for me for some reason. Hmm. Okay, what I'm gonna do is stop sharing and then... Yep, when in doubt, stop sharing. <laughs> Well, now it's, now it's advancing like crazy. Okay, number two. What person who did not uh, own a telescope? But you're not sharing right now. Oh, I'm not sharing. Not sharing. Oh, I... I you have to go I'm back big, and share one more time. I'm in big problem. Big, big trouble here. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> trouble is I'm on the wrong screen. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> well... Here we go. Time is important. To, yeah, time is important here. So I want to get things going. Okay, question number two. Question number two. What person who did not own a telescope co-discovered this comet while observing M70 through a friend's telescope in 1995? Now, how lucky is that? And how frustrating for the friend? I mean, geez, who gets top billing now? Uh, right. Uh, Thomas Bopp. And that was a, a great comet. I think... Uh, well, it's certainly, well, I'd say it was the best comment I've ever seen, and at least, at least in, in my life. Very, very good. Uh, number three, comet C2014, uh, UN271, is famous for what cometary record? It's the largest nucleus, uh, which is about 85 miles in diameter. And I, I think most of these comets, what their nucleus is 10, 15, something like that. So this was a real giant among, among comets. So those three questions, um, they were answered correctly by uh, several people, and their names will be added to our door prize list for January, which we'll be taken care of in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Andrew Corkill, Josh Kovac, uh, Yolanda Combrink, Jim Mosley, John Williams, and Cameron Gillis. Thank you for, for participating in that. Uh, congratulations. Now we're gonna go on to this week's questions. Uh, if you know the answers, please send them, them to secretary at astroleague.org. Uh, that goes to Terry Mann, who's our secretary, and she'll handle all that. So if you know the answers, jot them down and email them to her. First question. Okay, here we are. We got a little Spanish chart there. But I think you can figure what, what this stuff out, or what, what this stuff is. Question I can number help one. you if you want. <laughs> yeah, there. I, I I know I have people out there looking over my shoulder, so to speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, the sun is is bright. It shines it with a magnitude of about minus twenty six point seven as viewed from Earth. What is this magnitude as seen from the orbit of Neptune? Further away, a about minus twelve or minus thirteen, or about as bright as the full moon. B about minus 19, which is about halfway between the magnitude value of the full moon and the sun, or C, uh, minus 26.7, the same uh, value as viewed from Earth. Question number two. This is another uh, topic which we, we like to talk about, is double stars, and we have a little uh, primary guide on that. What percentage of stars are members of a binary or multiple system? A, surely less than 10%, B, nearly 100%, maybe not everybody, but almost everybody, C, it may be as high as 85%, or it may be less than 50%. No one will say for sure. Know the answer? Send it to uh, secretary at astroleague.org. One more question. We hear about supermoon quite a bit. 
And I have my own feelings about supermoon. I find it kind of amusing sometimes. Question number three, a supermoon occurs when a full moon is near perigee. When the full moon occurs near apogee, such as the one coming up on February 5th, what is it called? A, no official definition exists. B, mini moon, <clears throat> mini moon. C, sub moon. If you know the answer to that, jot it down and send it to secretary at astroleague.org. Those are the three questions. Um, I'd like to end this presentation with one more thing. Just want to remind everyone that uh, Astronomical League Live will be on Friday night, January 27th. Chuck Allen, who's the vice president of the Astronom Astronomical League, will be speaking. Um, on this program, we have a, a number of uh, people uh, present things about the night sky. Uh, not everything related to the Astronomical League, a lot of every, but everything is related to amateur astronomy. So please join us for that. Uh, on this on this station, uh, you'll be hearing more about it when the, when the time approaches. So thank you, thank you. Um, that's it. I appreciate you listening to all this, and um, you might want to check out our Facebook page for some of these guides in Spanish that we have popping up now and then, as well as English. Thank you, Scott. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for sure. for uh, presenting those questions. Uh, you know, we're going to have to have you on also to talk. I mean, you do great talks about uh, the solar system and uh, uh, space in general. And uh, so we're, we're going to have to take advantage of that because... Oh, uh, that's fine. As, as long as my screen, sh screen share works, everything as long as, smoothly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you've done it a million times. You just, uh, it was just kind of a, a glitch, but that's no big deal. Um, uh, but uh, uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the contributions of uh, David Eicher. Uh, he's coming up next, uh, and he's going to talk about you know Dave's exotic universe uh, and talk about some Abel galaxies. But this is a guy who is constantly uh, uh, working on new, not only written material, but the guy does back-to-back -back lectures. He does, he's not only on Global Star Party often, but he contributes to astronomy clubs. Uh, he is now um, a major force in the Starmus event, which is one of the most amazing, uh, you know, astronomy events in the world. Uh, the, the one that we did in uh, Armenia had tens of thousands of people attend it. Uh, it was just stunning, unbelievable, you know, and just this, this, uh, uh, you know, when you mash it all together of all the things that uh, David Eicher does, uh, he's fitting in, I think, many lifetimes. I don't know what, what kind of vitamins he's on or, or what he, how he does this every day, but uh, he is an amazing individual. I also want to say that uh, it's not lost on me that astronomy.com and astronomy magazine have done a lot to uh, uh, participate in the programs that we do, and I'm very, very grateful. So I'm going to turn it over to David Eicher. David, thank you so much for coming on to the 111th Global Star Party. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here as always. And I couldn't be here last week. I was actually giving a talk on the Civil War, of all things, after quite a long... Oh, I term. forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm back so there, to the, There's this whole Civil War life that, that uh, David has, so... Back to the present here, at least, and, and I'll share my screen, if I can, uh, for the moment here, and I'll see if you can see a PowerPoint uh, and see if I can start a PowerPoint slideshow. And can you see an illustration of Cygnus X1? I think we're in business, if you can. Yes. And I have a positive report, Scott, for you tonight because I'm going to be talking about object number five out of the list of 424 that I have. Okay. <laughs> We're making progress. We're moving on. Here. That's right. So I wanted to talk uh, this uh, week, if I could, briefly about an interesting object that, that typifies lots of objects that we normally don't think about much that are spread across the sky. These are Abel galaxy clusters, uh, and this is Abel 2256, which is up near the northern uh, North Celestial Pole. 
1958, the great extragalactic astronomer George Abel, he was at UCLA. He's one of those guys in that era I never had the chance to meet, unfortunately, but I think some of you probably did. And he was an amazing guy who worked on all sorts of uh, uh, objects in the Milky Way and, and uh, distant galaxies as well. So he produced this famous catalog of galaxy clusters uh, and it was extended then much later on after the 1950s and eventually uh, uh, numbered more than 4,000 galaxy clusters. And you don't think of, you, you think of galaxy clusters, the really bright ones, you know, around the sky, uh, but there are an enormous number of galaxy clusters that are very distant, most of them, of course, that are spread around the sky, and therefore they're very small in terms of angular size. Uh, but it's a big universe with lots of clusters of galaxies, and they're interesting things to look at and to photograph. Some of them are so faint that they're sort of beyond the reach of visual observation, but they're good for astro imagers. We have these very high tech astro imagers who are now going after really faint things. Um, and this is one of them. It contains more than 500 uh, galaxies within the wow. cluster, and it's about 800 million light years away. Um, it's about 10 million light years across, which is about the same physical diameter as our local group, which has uh, 55 and maybe as many as 100 galaxies. So you can see that this is a much richer, fi five to 10 times richer environment of galaxies than what we're used to around us. So these are interesting objects to look at and to photograph. Uh, because many of them are very faint. The brightest galaxy in this one is NGC 6331, and it's a 15th magnitude object. Uh, and UGC 10726 is the second brightest member, which is uh, just a little bit fainter. It's about 140 arc minutes across, uh, but uh, most of the galaxies, of course, are in a much smaller size on the sky than that in this central core. David, are you uh, intending to show an image of this? Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. After I stop blabbing on and horrifying you with all of these data, y'all <laughs> no. have to do an image. Okay. Forgive me. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Scott, you're always looking out for my best interests. Bless you. Okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, you know me, it's hopeless. I do. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, th this cluster has been studied by Chandra and in, in the X-ray portion of the spectrum. And it's interesting because they're really main uh, three, three subclusters within the this group um, that are remnants of a merger, thought to be remnants of a very old merger and a, a bullet-like system of, of infalling gas within the cluster as well. And then we get to, oh, well, we didn't, you know, boy, I thought we were going to get to an image of the cluster. Again, I disappoint Scott here. It's a star map. <laughs> we're not even to the image yet. But but this is- hey, I love the, star maps. I do. The, you know, we might get at this rate, you might let me get to object seven out of 424 and then- <laughs> Pull a plug on the whole damn thing, you know. But but uh, let me just say quickly while we're here okay. that no no kidding, Ron Stoyan a few years ago published this phenomenal star atlas. If you don't have a copy of this, there are more detailed star atlases that are really large and unwieldy, you know, to deal with. But Ron Stoyan's uh, star atlas, the Interstellarum Deep Sky Atlas, is a phenomenal. Uh, compact star atlas, no bigger than a laptop computer, and it has a mind-numbing uh, number of deep sky objects plotted on it. So it's an, you know, I, I'm not affiliated with Ron Stoyan in any way, trust me, he's in Germany, but, but this is an incredible star atlas, and you can see the cluster there left of center, and there's a brighter NGC galaxy there, 6217 in the region and so on. This is in Ursa Minor and, and I'm eventually over many years, if you'll put up with me going to work my way southward, <laughs> Scott, but we're still in near the North Celestial Pole here. So here we go. Here, finally. Oh, uh, there it is. Uh, in Austria, who's a great deep sky imager, um, has produced this image of the cluster and you can see there are a couple of what uh, extragalactic astronomers call CD galaxies that are that are very large, centrally dominant elliptical galaxies, as is typical in a lot of rich clusters. 
near the center of this group and a lot of bright Milky Way foreground stars. But this is the, the best amateur image that I've found of, of this cluster. That's a beautiful image here. And I will just go on then to illustrate briefly um, how many galaxies are in this cluster. This is a Dutch astro imager, Menno wow. Janssen has produced this image and labeled, you, you think that some of us waste our time thinking about galaxies all the time. Here he's labeled all the cluster members that are in this field. And you can see how many galaxies are, are in this uh, um, field of about 140 arc minutes. So, um, you know, everybody needs a hobby and uh, bless him for, for doing <laughs> this, you know, because this is an incredible piece of work. And, and no, that's it, awesome. It is. Many, many, you know, all the morphological types are here too, you know, ellipticals and spirals and, and everything, you know, lenticulars, barred spirals, the whole nine yards. So that's kind of the object, you know, which is a little bit more, unless you have a really large, you know, daub or something, this is a little bit more for astro imagers this, as a challenge object. But of course, a good, you know, 16 or 20 or 25 inch scope in a, in a dark sky would show this, the brighter uh, members of this cluster very nicely. So um, anyway, just a quick reminder that this is the 50th anniversary year of Astronomy Magazine. We, we commenced the year um, with uh, a special on comets, which our esteemed colleague David Levy wrote the introduction for. And I will stop sharing my screen now and say that we have a really big special issue that when I was not fooling around giving talks, I pulled the lineup together for, that's gonna be the August issue uh, this year, which is the 50th anniversary issue of the magazine. And we will have a very nice introduction to that whole issue. First of all, from Dave Walther, who was the publisher of the magazine originally and the older brother of Steve Walther who founded the magazine and tragically very early on died of a brain tumor. Um, but there's an introduction by Dave Walther who is still around, re long retired. And we'll have an introduction by Annie Dreen as well, the executive producer of Cosmos and, of course, the widow of Carl Sagan, who's a friend as well. So that's going to be really special. We have an issue, Scott, I will tell you that this is the first copy that is out. Wow. None of you have seen yet. That is the March issue that has, what does it have, among other things? Not only the eclipses, you know, late this year and especially next year, but Scott, you were there. Starmus rocks Armenian. Starmus rocks Armenian. It did. It really Starmus did. Starmus story is coming out. And then, and yet another highlight is that there's this fellow who's been writing for us in one way or another, Glenn Chapel, hmm. who started writing for me when I was 17 years old. And I was doing this little publication, Deep Sky Monthly. He began writing a column that's the column for beginners in Astronomy Magazine many, many years ago. And he's now finally hanging it up. And we have a distinguished new columnist taking over that beginner's column, whose name is Molly Wakeling, who you may just see speak next. So Molly, welcome to the Astronomy Magazine team. And Molly has many, many great ideas of things that she's going to write about in the coming months. And the first column of Molly's is going to be in that special August issue. Wow. So okay. it all comes together. I'm get, I'm going to request a signed issue. So <laughs> I want a couple cool. of, of that. <laughs> oh, no. I'm uh, yeah, absolutely blown away and got some really big shoes to fill. So <laughs> oh, you're going to be great. We're we're looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic, Molly. And I think you'll have a lot of a lot of fun with it, of course, too. Yeah, absolutely. So welcome to the team and. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. And it's a pleasure to yeah. be back with you after talking about Gettysburg last week. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to have you on. And it's great to have you introduce Molly as the uh, as one of the new editors of Astronomy Magazine. So that's great. That's great. Thank you. Well, Molly, you've got the uh, you've got the stage uh, now. You're not new to Global Star Party, um, but um, I'm I'm sensing that this is a new era for you. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm still going to give my regular segment of this John and Molly's universe <laughs> on here because uh, I love getting on and, and talking about uh, all of um, all these different incredible objects in space that you guys should definitely go look at and take pictures of and just like know exist out there. Uh, sure. So uh, tonight I'm talking about um, SCA 63, the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, yeah. Let's see, today is the 17th. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yes, the Sunflower Galaxy. I've imaged it a couple of times, and uh, it's it's a really cool and inter interesting looking galaxy, and I'll get into why here shortly. So um, it is what is called a flocculent spiral galaxy, <laughs> and uh, flocculent as a word is just kind of a, a joy to say, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, it's a fun word used to describe these kind of really dusty galaxies. It actually, it has only two actual arms, even though it looks like it has over a dozen arms. But one of the dividing characteristics of flocculent galaxies is the fact that their arms are very disordered and chaotic. So, um, and the the two arms are a lot easier to see in the infrared image, apparently. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it looks like a whole lot more arms than that when you look at it. It's in Canis Benetici, which is the um, uh, hunting dogs constellation up more toward the north that also has a whole bunch of galaxies in it. But this one is a lot easier to spot than a lot of them. All right, so where to find it. So if you are familiar with where M51 Whirlpool Galaxy and M101 are located sort of near the end of the handle of the Big Dipper, the Sunflower Galaxy is not too far away from it. Um, between the star at the end of the Big Dipper, of the Big Dipper's handle, Alcade, and another prominent star, Cole Corolli. And uh, it's a little closer to Cole Corolli, but uh, kind of in line with Alcade there. So uh, yeah, up in the north, off the handle of the Big Dipper a little ways. All right, so some fast facts. It's magnitude 9.3, so not, not too bad for a galaxy. 15 to 34 million light years away. The estimate varies depending on how the galaxy is measured um, based on if they're looking at um, supernova spectra or um, uh, like a Doppler shift and stuff like that uh, has yielded some various measurements on how distant it is. It's it's in the M51 cluster of, of galaxies in that, in that, in that M51 group uh, with the Whirlpool Galaxy group. It has about 400 billion stars and is 12 and a half by seven arc minutes in size. So not terribly tiny. In fact, uh, actually images pretty decently even in a, a 500 millimeter refractor. And it was discovered by uh, Pierre Machin who uh, added several items to Charles Messier's catalog. And this one was done in 1779. Hmm. Um, okay, yeah, there's the next. <laughs> so flocculent, what is a flocculent galaxy? So the name means uh, flaky or fluffy. Think of a flock of wolves, kind of the, the origin of this word. It has uh, patchy, discontinuous spiral arms. And actually some 30% of spiral galaxies are considered to be flocculent. And 10% are, of, uh, compared to 10% of grand design spiral galaxies, such as the Whirlpool galaxy. So it's actually a more common type than the type that the Whirlpool galaxy is. Uh, the structure is probably the results, all the the um, the dust and the kind of multiple looking arms is probably the result of a process called stochastic self-propagating star formation or SSPFS as it's called. <laughs> and um, what that is is the, uh, so star formation propagates, aka like moves forward, moves outward, kind of move, moves along by shock waves that are produced by the stellar winds and supernovae from existing and older stars moving through the interstellar medium. So the shock waves kind of shake up the dust and start the kind of kickstart the star formation process. And uh, the word stochastic is just a word that means a, a random process, like um, radioactive decay is a stochastic process. Hmm. And the the GIF that's showing here is um, 
it starts with a, just a couple, this is a simulation. It starts with a couple of cells that have uh, new stars forming in them. And then uh, randomly the, the adjacent cells can form new stars. And then this quickly propagates out to more and more stars forming. And then I added a, um, a rotation term and you can kind of see how the apparent many armed, although not actually many armed structure comes into play. And the dark spots here are active areas of star formation and the lighter spots are where stars have formed recently or areas that are in regenerations kind of post star formation. So there's your science for the day. <laughs> awesome. So uh, in, I like to show what these things look like in other wavelengths because uh, you can sometimes learn different things about what's going on in in all kinds of objects in space by looking at them in different wavelengths of light. So here we actually have two different radio images. One of them is the national um, radio, the, the, the Green Bank Radio Telescope, <laughs> whatever the, the NRAS stands for, it's the Green Bank Radio Telescope and the Very Large Array Sky Survey at 1.4 gigahertz. And ordinarily radio images are, are relatively low resolution because of the long wavelength. But actually um, I found this image from the low far two meter sky survey that's only at 144 megahertz. It is remarkably high resolution. And I actually went and looked up the paper for it because I wanted to make sure that this was actually <laughs> the image that, that came out of that survey at this wavelength. And apparently it is, so it's just a really, they did a really high uh, resolution survey at one point of a, of a small patch of sky that picked up the sunflower galaxy. So it's kind of a radio picture of it where uh, the, the core of the galaxy is quite bright and there's a couple of other um, bright spots that are probably areas of active star formation, lots of hydrogen glowing. Um, in uh, infrared, there's these are two different representations of the same data from the Spitzer telescope. Um, but on the left, I don't know what, what wavelengths they chose to make that image from. You can see a lot of the, um, like that's infrared cuts through the dust. So here you're really seeing the stars and the gas clouds and, and really cut through the dust. And the picture on the right is, is a color image of a composite infrared data at three different wavelengths to kind of put it into a, a color palette where it actually specified that Red is eight micron light, green is four and a half micron, and blue is 3.6 micron, um, which like uh, blue light, or sorry, um, red light is like uh, 750 nanometers, AKA 0.75 microns. So uh, th that gives you some scale of, of um, kind of how far we're moving into the infrared here. And actually eight micron is not very far into the infrared. It's still, I think, considered relatively near infrared, um, but, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, here's an ultraviolet image of it where uh, you can see even different kinds of details in some really bright ultraviolet glowing spots, which is where um, new stars are being formed because the hot young stars tend to put out a lot of ultraviolet light. And then on the right is the X-ray image of it from XM and Newton. And these also tend to be relatively low resolution um, just because of the instrumentation involved in needing to create an X-ray telescope when you can't use like a, a, like a mirror actually to uh, bounce the X-rays around. So um, you end up with these kind of uh, lower resolution images than you might expect. But for anybody who speaks X-ray, the, that's the color palette listed down below the uh, energy, the X-ray energy that was assigned to each of those color channels. And I'm not sure if these, if these spikes here are like, diffraction spikes for x-rays or if there's some kind of jets coming out of it i didn't see much about some x-ray jets coming out of it but um it does have a a special type of nucleus a galactic nucleus called a liner nucleus um that might i didn't go read that deep into it maybe it puts out x-rays i don't know <laughs> all right so if you want to go observe m63 in optical light uh the best time to do it is between february and july really about the April time frame, which is right in the heart of galaxy season. And it's a galaxy season galaxy. It's relatively bright. You can't actually see it with binoculars as a fuzzy patch. At six inches, you'll get a little more of its oblong shape. And at 10 to 12 inches of aperture and some patience, you can start to pick out some of the structure. 
photographically, it's bright enough to do from the city uh, if you're using light pollution filters, although you will need a lot of subframes to beat down the noise. Uh, the image in the background here is is one of mine, um, and it's it's noisier than it looks in in this uh, uh, in, on, as the sideshow background. It's kind of hard to beat that noise down. And smaller fields of view are better to pick up more of the details. So like Schmidt Castigrains are great to to image this galaxy. But you can actually get pretty nice detail even with like a 500 millimeter refractor, which is what I'd used to take this image was my Takahashi refractor. So you can still see quite a lot uh, even at that shorter focal length. So you can really image it with whatever telescope you have, to be honest. And that's what I got. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, uh, I, was, I was sharing kind of via chat some of our, the last numbers that we did for the, we had our 110th global star party and, um, you know, normally uh, it's not unusual for us to get a few thousand people to tune in, uh, but we broke a record uh, for the 110th global star party. We had, um, I'm looking at the numbers right now, we got, we had 36,000 people uh, watch the, uh, uh, the uh, Facebook uh, broadcast, or not the broadcast, but the replay. Uh, you guys, uh, uh, it, it's, it's great if you can watch us live, but uh, we understand that everybody has busy lives, but it was great to see, you know, that number uh, tune in. So we had a lot of engagement. We had a couple, over 2,000 people engage with the program uh, and uh, the reach was just slightly more than the viewership. So um, again, we want to thank everyone for supporting us with uh, that kind of um, uh, you know participation and viewership and all the rest of it. Um, and hopefully it just gets better and better. So thanks a lot. Um, our next uh, speaker uh, is, I, I should just have this memorized, but I don't. Um, <laughs> Our next speaker um, is, sorry, hang in there with me, Carlos Aragon. Carlos, I met Carlos uh, as, as he was kind of watching our programs uh, maybe about two years ago, and then I invited Carlos to come onto the program. Carlos is probably one of the most inspiring amateur astronomers that gets engaged in astronomy outreach, and I'm going to let you... I'm going to let him tell his story, but uh, this is a guy that is really making a difference in people's lives. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a story of triumph, uh, and, uh, you know, he des certainly deserves some sort of an Oscar or an award for what he's doing uh, because he's making a big difference. Uh, Carlos, do you want to come on to, uh, to our program here? Absolutely, I'm here. Great, great. So um, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background on Carlos, uh, two years ago I had learned that Carlos had uh, troubles of his own. Uh, he had, um, uh, if I remember it correctly, Carlos, you were, um, uh, you were hurt uh, during uh, uh, your, your work as an aircraft mechanic, as I recall. And yes. you had... Uh, Maybe your shoulder was crushed or something like that. Anyways, um, uh, and you, uh, you know, sadly uh, had to recover with painkillers and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna let you tell this story, <laughs> okay? Because it is an amazing story, and you guys need to hear it from the person that experienced it. So, thanks again for coming on to Global Star Party, Carlos. It's an honor to be here, Scott. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined the stream and watching uh, from around the world. Uh, it's incredible that we get to do this. Um, and no, it doesn't matter if I'm at home comfy in my garage. I still get nervous. It doesn't. Yeah. So All right. bear with me. Um, so welcome. I am the CEO of an organization in Tucson, Arizona called Reach for the Stars. Um, we are a new organization. We are three years old. And the way it came about was kind of interesting. Um, and I'll share a little bit about that. But uh, our mission is to, one second. Our mission is to 
Use astronomy and charity work to uplift, empower, and positively impact health issues in youth, teens, and adults. So, um, by the way, I'm going to go through just a couple slides, but just so you have an idea, all the, the none of these are stock images. They are all from us, uh, my team. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Am I still here? You are still there. <laughs> you okay. just dropped out for just a second. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't share my screen. Okay. So um, I joined the military when I was 18. I, I was in for um, almost seven years. And I had my entire life ahead of me. I was dedicated to the military. I was so excited. Uh, you know, I, I did my best in everything that I could. And I learned my job very well. But um, one day after, after five and a half years, I was inside of a C-130 air, aircraft and I, um, I was crushed. I was crushed in my right shoulder. I severed a few nerves, including the long thoracic, which controls all the strength in your shoulder, especially overhead strength. And as a, as a mechanic, you know, half the work you do is over your head. So that was devastating. I was immediately put on painkillers and, and they didn't really describe anything to me. I was young um, and soon became dependent. You know, if you take, if you take them, especially at the level that I was for any amount of time over a month, your brain starts to change and it gets dependent. So I, I became dependent very quickly. Um, and they immediately, they immediately medically retired me from the air force. So I lost my entire career um, in an afternoon and I was forced to move off the base uh, relatively quickly. And my wife at the time, um, she was struggling to find work. Um, and long story short, I ended up becoming homeless, divorced, addicted. For a little over a year, I was on the streets of Tucson living in at first, it was friend, a few friends' houses, but then it ended up being uh, a bush, actually, next to a Safeway. And I made a little cave out of this big old bush, and it was, you know, you try to hide from everyone. It was, it's very scary, especially at night. And um, so that went on. It was very difficult, but I make a disability, so... My 40% disability paycheck was enough to, to keep me alive and keep me fed. Um, one day someone basically looked at me and, and said, you're, you're dying. And I realized that I was, I could feel my body withering. And they took me to the VA rehab. I joined and decided to change my life. Well, after about six months, I graduated. And even though I had I was clean off narcotics. I had a fresh start. I couldn't find work. I didn't know who I was anymore. I don't, I didn't remember myself from five years ago. Uh, you know, I grew up as this, a, a, you know, happy kid with aspirate, like big dreams, but uh, that all, that all left. So I became really depressed. And one day here in Tucson, we went to Walmart and got a $40 telescope. Now, I'm not advocating for Walmart telescopes, <laughs> but that little telescope changed my life drastically. And that night I set it up in the backyard. I pointed it at the brightest thing in November or something, and it happened to be Jupiter. Now the moons were visible, of course, I could see cloud bands and every few seconds or so I could see a little mushy spot on the surface and I realized it was Jupiter and it just blew my mind. I could not understand how a little plastic tube with a couple lenses could transfer me from one place on earth to a bird's eye view of a planet or something. So for the next three hours, I began hunting. I started hunting and looking everywhere and getting just completely 
dove into this and I wanted to learn more. And I went inside after a few hours and my wife, she said, whatever you're doing, you need to keep doing that, that that's helping. So keep doing that. So I did some research. I got a X, uh, I got a eight inch, uh, telescope, the Dobsonian. And, um, I, I just, I realized that when I was looking through the eyepiece, I didn't feel any type of stress, anxiety, any type of PTSD symptoms. I was, I was there traveling space. And I, I wondered if anyone else could get the same type of feeling out of it, could get the same type of help or coping mechanism. <laughs> David Levy is raising his hands. Hey, right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a huge, huge thing. And, and so we just brought the telescope to the Safeway, um, to the Safeway and uh, see to see if anyone else would want to come. And it was a huge hit. Um, at the time, I couldn't, I didn't know there was an astronomy club out here. Uh, we're actually closer to Vail, just outside town. And, um, and so we just started a little Facebook group and it blew up and, and for a little while we were, we were volunteering at a veterans non nonprofit, helping the homeless and that fell through. Um, and so we were at home just thinking, you know, we don't need to be at a nonprofit to be doing something for people. We can still do stuff at home, but why don't we combine the charity work that we're doing, the homeless backpacks, the food program with this astronomy stuff that we're doing and mesh it all into one charity work is good for the soul. It's uplifting. Um, there's so many positive things about it. And then it's the same thing with astronomy. It, it turns out that astronomy is proven to help with stress and anxiety. What the heck? Why aren't people talking about this? So we we created Reach for the Stars, and the name describes itself, but it it is a nonprofit that combines the two, charity work and astronomy, into one, focusing on kids at first, because think about it. Kids are easier to mentor when they're young, and adults were not so easy to get you know, to change unless you're in a very vulnerable state like I was when I was very depressed after even after being in rehab. But the main thing we focus on kids is is there there's a Arizona has 17 percent higher than the national average for youth uh, stress, anxiety and suicide. Hmm. And that's very. That hurts. So. The fact that astronomy can can be so influential and change a lot of things, we we've wanted to focus in on youth, and so that's our main program is youth. We also have a monthly star party um, on the outside of town. Uh, it's always everything we do is free, and uh, it's it's just a, an amazing organization. And could you believe it? We're three years old today, not today, a month ago. But we, we, we won, we got in the top, I don't know how to say it. We were awarded a favorite, the top three nonprofits in, in Tucson, which there's a few thousand of them. Wow. We were awarded the, the best nonprofit in Tucson between the Humane Society and Pima Animal Care Center. Wow. Puppies. I don't know how we're competing. It's hard to puppies. compete against puppies. My goodness. So, wow. Whatever our mission, it's working. It's changing kids' lives. We we have a food program, the homeless backpack program. The kids build the boxes, build the backpacks. We have them involved with the charity work. We involve them with STEM, um, rockets, science experiments, anything to find out what they could be interested in in the realm of space and science um, with a goal to better the future, with a goal to better their lives, to send them on a trajectory, help them find, find something to stick to and to want to learn. Kids, a lot of kids don't like school, including our son. So we, you know, finding something that really interests them and, and you know, gets them excited can help with school too. 
Um, you might not think it, but kids do have anxiety. Think about bullying. Think about oh, yeah. problems at home with your with their parents, um, divorces, um, all all kinds of things. And so these kids need help, and we're that's what our mission is. Um, we also give uh, we donate telescopes to low income families, the little Celestron first scopes, um, and we do fundraisers for that. But it's an amazing mission and I'm very, very proud and happy to be here. And and it's incredible to me that the terrible experiences I went through led to this life-changing, you know, this is a 24-7 passion that I get to live. That's awesome. And it's not a hobby anymore. It's a lifestyle. And a lot of that will resonate with with the viewers, you know. So for some of us, it's a lifestyle and uh, it's just it's very inspirational in many ways. So very fortunate to, to be doing this and we hope to spread the word, but one more, one quick thing, one thing I want to talk about is how, how do we get them excited about astronomy? Sometimes it's, it's a little difficult, especially if they're always on Xbox playing call of duty or something, you know, having them come from that to this, we have to blow their minds, okay? Blow their minds at star parties on these live streams. Do anything that we can to figure out what they're interested in or get them interested in. For example, at our stargazing events, we try to have one of every piece, every type of equipment, a refractor, a reflector, an SET, um, a, a big daub, uh, binoculars, an EAA setup. Um, even for teens and adults, we try to figure out what they like to try to get them to come back. If they don't have a great experience and it doesn't blow their minds, they're not going to come back in the future to another stargazing event if their friends are talking about it. No, well, let's go to the movies. No, we have to blow their minds. So I, I, I want to inspire each of you to truly try to share this lifestyle with as many people as possible and to get you know, try to figure out what they're interested in and share your knowledge with them. You know, we we let people rent out some, not rent, but we get, we let them borrow the equipment for a month or three months to try to get that that to uh, flourish into something. And and uh, so we have to get them excited. Whatever we is, whatever it is, we have to do. Um, we need to try to do it. So we even have like a big. 14 foot projector on the side of our trailer and we show the sky safari or Stellarium app um, during sunset until it gets dark and then we switch it to red and we, we try to give them an amazing experience, mm. fire them. And all that, all the above that I just talked about wraps up into making their lives more positive and uh, more healthy. And so that's our mission. We're currently working from home and uh, we hope to find a building soon, whether it's an abandoned building, I don't care. We just need a building to turn into a community observatory and learning center for free access to space for anyone who wants to come and join us for volunteer work galore. Uh, we do all types of fun stuff like that. So thank you guys for having me. And um, it's an honor to be here again. Wow. Uh, good Lord. Thank you again. Uh, yeah, I, I've got uh, I've got uh, goosebumps uh, from all of this. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I know that uh, that astronomy is can be life changing. Uh, that it's a gateway to uh, exploration. It's a gateway to constant uh, to start a constant path, a journey of curiosity. Um, you know, and that wakes people up and lets them see the other possibilities that exist in their lives. You know, uh, most astronomers know, and this this is one of the things, one of the great advantages of astronomy is that we know that we're, you know, uh, as Carl Sagan said, you know, we're on this pale blue dot that's out there flying through space. We're on, we're sharing this spaceship, uh, kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of the way I think about it, you know. Um, uh, but uh, you are you are someone that I so deeply admire, Carlos, for the work that you're doing uh, to lift people up. Uh, you know, uh, most people when they see homeless people, they want they just want to pretend they don't exist. 
uh, you know, because they think okay. they're going to be asking them for money or they're going to be, you know, there's going to be something wrong. They're not clean, whatever it is. OK. Uh, and for you to roll up your sleeves and show these people the universe and to feed them and to get them going. Wow. I mean, that is just that is amazing. It is. It is really amazing. And, and um, so I'm I'm pleased that you're you're back on to tell your story again. Uh, I have posted your website in chat a couple of times here. Um, if you're moved by what Carlos and his team are doing, give them some support. You know, uh, every little bit helps. And uh, you know, I, I, as soon as I can jump on, I'm gonna I'm gonna send some money your way as well. So, I, I so really you know, every, every dollar, <laughs> every, every dollar, dollar helps, right? Every dollar pays for a three course meal for a low income family, your neighbors. Um, so one one quick thing my wife also went she had a traumatic brain injury she became bedridden and became an alcoholic and we met in rehab hmm. that's where we met and i know it sounds crazy but when you have someone who understands triggers uh understands the signs of of you know whether it be cravings or depression or all that type you know, those, those symptoms, um, it's very, very helpful. And she is an amazing beacon of light and she has a, an amazing story herself and together. I, I don't know, uh, you know, she, we just got married a few months ago and oh wow, I, I, I've never been happier in my life. Even, you know, when I was making money and, um, in the military had a career ahead of me, that's, that's nothing compared to this. And we don't make any money. We're all volunteers. Carlos, so, I have a question for you. Yes. I wanted, to, I wanted to first of all say that I was deeply, deeply moved by your presentation. It is one of the most moving that I've ever heard on the Global Star Party. Where is the Safeway? Which Safeway did you set up your telescope at? The one in Vail on Marion Cleveland Way in Wentworth? <laughs> no kidding. Yes, oh, sir. great. I know yes. you live just down the street. <laughs> just down the street from us, almost one <laughs> distance. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And next time you do that, please let me know. I will. I will. Thank you so much. That was, that's very kind of you to say. Yeah. yeah. And Carlos, I just want you to know, too, that uh, uh, you have resources uh, not only through uh, Global Star Party, but uh, Explore Scientific would be uh, so moved to help out and myself personally and um, you know there's uh, you know this is the important stuff this is this is why this is a big reason why we do this these these uh, uh, this outreach and uh, you know I am you know I, I do sidewalk astronomy from time to time uh, I often run into someone that is homeless uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a college town real close to Explore Scientific, and, uh, you know, I never turn them away. I always engage with them, talk with them. Uh, many times Just they're hello, drunk or, or they're whatever, ways. you know, but, uh, but you know, if you can capture someone's attention a little bit, um, you know, I'm not handing them food, uh, and maybe I should, uh, but... Um, Say hello. Yeah, you know, that can right. make someone acknowledge good. them as a human being, right? Yeah, people ignore you, and it's it's a uh, it's very hurtful. So, yeah. Well, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Carlos, and hopefully you you're inclined to come on to the next Global Star Party, and to show more about what you're doing, and uh, um. You know, uh, let's uh, let's do what we can to bring more attention to uh, your reach for the Stars program. Thanks again. Thanks, Scott. Okay. All right. So um, uh, up next is Maxi Filares. We are going to go all the way down to Argentina, where Maxi uh, does uh, astrophotography of the southern skies and has helped many many people get started in. Uh, in their journey of uh, uh, imaging the night sky. So Maxi, uh, take us away. Thank you, Scott. Good night, everyone. And well, thank you for inviting me again.
it's good to be back in this uh, 23 year and well you know i well last week i couldn't be here because i i wasn't in my home i was in vacations uh, in the south of my country and also uh, you know i i went to to take a break uh, clear my mind enjoy the view the the beach and the and the heat of the summer here in argentina mm. Uh, but also, I have to do some ast uh, astrophotography. You know, my wife say, "Oh, you are going to take your gear again in the car." And no, no, the big one now, but the small one, yeah, it's coming with me. So, well, I, I, we, we, we went to Las Grutas. Uh, this is a small city uh, that is in the Patagonia desert, uh, but in front of the uh, Argentine uh, sea and also uh, I went there two years ago uh, uh, almost because in that place it was the 2020 solar eclipse that we went with Nico, uh, Alan, oh, yeah. and Cesar went to there so for me it was uh, live that again in the journey and the places that we've been and you know you know I uh, you know, when I was in the route uh, driving, I I had to say to my wife, I had to start there because we were in, we were in there, uh, sleeping in the desert, uh, waiting to the next day to go to Valcheta to see the, the the solar eclipse and all of that. So I I took a picture of that and sent to the to the guys and say, oh man, how how much memories, but well. Uh, we enjoy the beach, but also I met with um, a person that calls uh, Gerardo Ferrarino. He rent me a, a, a house when I been, uh, to, but he also uh, do astrophotography. Uh, he also is uh, well. He has uh, two uh, APODs uh, from NASA. Uh, he is a really good uh, photographer and astrophotographer. So uh, he invited me to go. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yeah, that's good. Great, great. So here's where I live in Chivilcoy, and I ran to Las Grutas. Here is in the Patagonia. You can see. I'm from the farm area, and this is the desert. It's, uh, but we have to see. So here's Las La Grutas, and he invited me to be uh, in this place. That uh, it's really, really far away from the city. Uh, well, I'll see, like, like here, for example, and. We have a really good a night. We don't have wind because uh, Patagonia is really windy from the west. But in this case, now we, we have clouds at the day, but the weather says uh, now it's going to a clear sky. So, well, we started to take pictures uh, for the night. And for example, I, I grabbed my Ascar ACL 2000, 200, sorry, and my CWO 5033. And this is, for example, a single picture of M42 that I took uh, of three minutes. And I today I stacked and, and uh, do the, the post processing. So I can I could get this from that stacking and process. You know, I did this a uh, weeks ago from my back year with the wow. same year. And great. yeah, I I really love to when I saw this I had to point this with my big one because that 
uh, colors of the lights behind these clouds is stunning. And wow. I had to point this when I go to Alberti before uh, Orion goes away again for the winter. <laughs> so, you know, I love also watching these places. And... Oh, yeah. Look at that. You know that there's some sort of embryonic star system being born there, right? Yeah, we have proto-solar systems. Or proto -solar. Yeah, I think yes. it's like that. Yes. Yeah, it's... Uh... In the background, the blackness behind the nebula, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. This is stunning. And, you know, I did this in my backyard, and when you process you can see the difference of the light pollution, how mm. how it works. You know, I invert the six and seven here in my backyard. And this is in La Gruta, it was almost two pointing wow. to the north and maybe one because it's completely desert. There is nothing else. So around. only at the east there are these two small towns and that's all and you know uh, this is uh, the the backstage of that night he's Gerardo Ferrarino you can see the the sea behind and the, and the sea is going down for the for that time and you can see it's a uh, 24 a uh, 40 PM, and then of course when you when we put our equipments together, we have to celebrate with some beers. <laughs> of course, and of course. Yeah, but it was a, a twenty a twenty one or nine PM and twenty, and we have we still have sun. You know, it was almost t uh, ten PM, and we have. A, a solar a solar light a, almost a, from a, the sun goes down but it's like the afternoon was amazing so I only pointed to this place a, M42 and surrounded a, because I every year I do pictures of M42 so I, I want to do this difference Maybe next year I come back and do some, uh, how you say, um, mosaics uh, with uh, eight inches. But they, I have to program for, I have a year to do that. Uh, but before that, I also pointed in my backyard to the three Marias that we call it here, uh, or the Orion Belt. Um, because I want to to get the honor to my national selection because we have the the three stars in our uh, in, in our in, in jersey for the World Cup winning. So, but I I didn't play it. But <laughs> I really love the feel of you, and you can see what here is that? the horn. Sorry. What lens are you using? An an Ascar ACL two uh, two hundred. The two hundred, okay. Yeah, Thank you. and it's it's a really good one. It's small, a little heavy maybe, but uh, well in this picture, but it's a little blurry. It's there the Ascar. Here's the the primary camera. And this is the guiding system and the SAR uh, uh, Plus with a uh, Skywatcher Star Adventurer. A really small equipment, uh, and you can do pictures of three minutes, and and that's okay, guiding. Um, and a couple of days again, I put my eight inches outside my backyard and I pointed to the same place. So you can see the field of view, how it changed. Let me put it almost at the same size. Uh, 
you can see the, the difference, of course, of the details, because this is what with the Newtonian, and mm. this is what yeah. with the, but this is one on one scale, and this is two one scale. <laughs> and even that, now it, to capture all this data, I was shocked. But anyway, I struggling with the light pollution. And in, when I did this picture, uh, I have almost a crescent moon and what well, uh, nearby. So well, I this is what I did uh, in this couple of weeks. Uh, maybe next uh, week, I will have uh, uh, something that come from mail. Uh, it's a L, L extreme filter, so I can ah, go. Yes, yeah. I I I I have to practice with a color camera. Maybe the the did you use it, Molly? Or yes, yeah, I've used it quite a lot from my also very bright sky city backyard. <laughs> uh, is uh, you you recommend that yes, right? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so um, I have the one point twenty five inch because my sensor has a uh, one inch uh, size. So it doesn't matter if I have the two inches or the one point twenty five. So I went to the 1.25 uh, because it's more, it's less uh, expensive. So, well, let's see what we have uh, in a couple of days. And uh, well, thank you for inviting me again. Uh, and see you next week, maybe. Okay, I hope so. I hope so. Great. And um, Maxi, uh, I know that you've been gone for a little while. Uh, uh, are you uh, are you planning any programs with um, larger star parties or uh, outreach programs out there? Mm, yes, I well today we create with some guys a small group from the nearby uh, area from Buenos Aires, one uh, in my city, and maybe another city to see if we could do some. A encounter or of stargazing, and of course, do some astrophotography, and mm. let's see what we get. But uh, also, we're still in touch with uh, with my friends, and see if we can do some uh, runaway and go to maybe Alberti or another place to to That'd do some cool. astrophoto. But uh, we still in touch. Uh, you know, uh, even our responsibility responsibility uh, in our families and homes uh, we try to to take some nights to see or uh, you know disconnect from the society yeah. to get more connected with the sky so uh, I don't know what is going to happen in this year I, I wish that everything go better and also in my country because it's struggling, but also with, with struggling with Brazil, it's happening. But anyway, uh, we have to continue going forward and keep looking up. That's right. Well, you also have that struggle that you're the world champions in soccer. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, you know, there are some guys that they watch again the hmm. the game. Yeah, uh, and they suffer more if they watch it the <laughs> first time. The second time. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. no I, I, and they already know what's going to happen. No, Anyways, no of course. Yeah. I, I watch. Right. I I watch the the penalties and 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 I I have to be honest. I cry because, <laughs> because no, I cry for uh, for for happiness. Uh, yes, because uh, I look to my dad and say, "We are champions. We are champions." You know, and now I, that's no, that's it's great. Un it's, a, it's a great story. So, yeah. <laughs> this is how the Argentines are. So, yes, that's right. That's okay, though. It's great. It's wonderful.
<laughs> well, thank you, Maxie. Thanks for coming on. And uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, and um, uh, we'll be back with uh, Marcello Souza in Brazil. So thanks for tuning in to the 111th Global Star Party. I'm going to slip out. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. You too. Thanks so much again for, for having on. me. <laughs> Definitely going to try imaging the sunflower again. I haven't tried that in a few. Yeah, it was interesting to learn about the structure, the spiral like arms and all the I rest of it. That. You know, yeah, yeah. it was a lot. I posted along with, uh, while she was talking, uh, Astronomy Magazine, uh, did an article on M63. So if you're kind of following along and you can kind of zoom back to the uh, chats there if you want to go back and click that link. Uh, obviously, um, we shared the link for Reach for the Stars. Uh, I, made a, uh, I made a small donation myself. And uh, um, but uh, yeah, of course. And um, uh, there are there's some things that uh, we want to do uh, at Explore Scientific with, uh, you know, normally we, we kind of have followed a traditional path of just making donations at events and that kind of thing. But I think that um, uh, what you're doing is, um, is definitely changing lives. I, you know, uh, I don't have to just hear it. I've, I've you know, experienced it. To a degree, and uh, so I'm I'm really enthusiastic about uh, supporting your program. Well, that that's incredible, and yeah, er, you know everyone's been through something. Everyone's in need in some kind of way. Sure. Whether they they're open to talk about it or not, and I think astronomy you know, when they say it's for everyone, not only age-wise, but mentally. Mm -hmm. So it's just very important. And I hope we can lower that 17% down, you know, and one day I hope to add a PTS, a dedicated PTSD for veterans program for astronomy. Mm -hmm. So Carlos, do you, do you get, uh, I mean, obviously you're affecting the you know, the psychological aspect of, of people struggling through this. Do you have people on your team? I was kind of looking at uh, the different people that have volunteered on your website. Do you have any, I mean, direct uh, 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 help from psychologists or do, do you have no. you gone that far? We're, so to become an actual healthcare organization, mm -hmm a lot of steps in licensing and um, we don't have any professional health care providers on our team. We do have volunteers who work as a school therapist or at a, a psychologist, um, but no one on the board. But uh, we, we reach out to those people and get mentored from them. Sure. So, so they they assist us and and basically, you know, we astronomy is a coping mechanism in itself. You don't really have to talk too much about the, you know, how to improve mental health outside of astronomy. Astronomy is the key. So the right. the better the better we can translate astronomy into their lives, whether it's giving them a telescope with a 10 hour lesson or private event at their house, learning, teaching their entire family how to use it. Um, we try to do what we can, but when we're working here from home, we just, we can't really do much. So we're trying to raise money. As you can see this big mass monster telescope behind me. Um, right. We're restoring it for, for a client. So I'm doing restorations and trying to, you know, raise money any way I can. So, is it broken? 
it was, it's just very that? old. He hasn't used it in eight years. He bought it 10 years ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it turns on, but the optics are, are quite, quite dirty. Um, the, the, there's gunk inside the bottom of the, of the tube. Yeah. So, so he had the corrector plate out at some point. Um, don't know why, but... Okay. I don't ask questions. I just dive in. Ask questions. <laughs> move on. Now, uh, if you run into a problem with that, I do have people on our staff that are very familiar. Uh, I would be one of them because I worked at Mead for 21 years. So, um, you know, and been all of, you know, helped build them and take them apart and repair them in the field and all the rest of it. So if you, if you need any advice or help in that regard, let me know. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, we're going to uh, uh, switch to a, a couple of little uh, videos and then we're going to come back uh, with um, Marcelo Souza in Brazil. So here we go. So it's a beautiful sunny day and uh, we have uh, uh, you know, our refractor out and I've got my Eclipse glasses on and I've got my safe solar filter. Of course the Eclipse is not here yet. But um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you some things about uh, solar filter safety. Uh, the filters that we use is the uh, Thousand Oaks material. It is uh, rated to the highest uh, ISO standards um, and uh, in actually independently tested by us as well. So just to make sure that those standards are met. So if you're going to use a telescope to look at the partial phases, and part of the, let me underline partial phases to you. You use eclipse glasses to observe the sun in partial phases when it's uh, in total. If you're going to be on the path of totality, you can take the glasses off. And only during that time, which is going to be roughly two minutes this time on August 21st, only during that time can you directly look up at where the sun is because it's completely blocked out. You'll see the corona, you'll see you know, lots of really cool effects that will they'll leave you speechless. But during all the partial phases, you have to have safe solar filtration. So how do you do it uh, properly? Uh, let me show you. First off, let's show you what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do is put on eclipse glasses and look through the telescope that's unfiltered. Uh, and I'll show you exactly why here. We're gonna point the telescope directly at the sun And right now, we have sunlight coming right through the eyepiece. Um, you know, turn that up a little bit. If you use solar glasses and look right at the filter material, you see it's already burning. It's burning a hole right through the solar filter material. That is how powerful a telescope is. So this is definitely something you don't want to do. You can now see that there is a hole through there. And that could be your eye. So this is what can happen if you think that you can use eclipse glasses to look through unfiltered telescopes or binoculars. If you do that, uh, the sun's energy is going to burn right through the filter and burn right into your eye. So if you're going to use a telescope or a pair of binoculars to watch the partial phases of a total eclipse or just to observe the sun to look for sunspots or something like that, uh, make sure that you are using an over-the-lens solar filter that has the... Uh, proper ISO safety rating and all of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this filter on. It's, uh, you can see how snugly it's fitting here. This is not about to come off, uh, uh, but uh, you know, if you have a loose fitting filter, use tape. Do anything that you can to make sure that the filter is not going to come off. Um, and then the, the other thing is too, is that uh, finder scopes, um, uh, optical finder scopes are like little telescopes and they need to be filtered as well. In this case, I just have a red dot finder. There is no um, magnifying power to it, so I'm not gonna use it to sight the sun in. The way I'm gonna sight in the sun is literally as I'm, I'm gonna look down at the shadow and align the scope up. So I'm getting the smallest shadow possible of the telescope as it's hitting the ground. And now I can safely look at the sun in comfort look at sunspots and if we have partial phases going on in the eclipse, I'll see them all.
Our Milky Way central black hole has a leak. This supermassive black hole, over 4 million times more massive than our sun, looks like it still has the remnants of a blowtorch-like jet dating back several thousand years. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope hasn't photographed the phantom jet yet, but it has helped find circumstantial evidence that the jet is still pushing feebly into a huge hydrogen cloud. This is further evidence that the black hole is not a sleeping monster, but periodically hiccups as stars and gas clouds fall into it. The hiccup results in superheated material blasting away from the black hole as narrow beams, or jets, shooting in the same direction as the black hole's spin axis, along with a flood of ionizing radiation. As the jet blows through the gas, it hits material, which creates a series of expanding bubbles that extend out to at least 500 light years. The streams continue to percolate out of the Milky Way's dense gas disk into the galactic halo. Scientists concluded that the black hole clearly surged in brightness as much as one million fold in the last million years. That would be enough for a jet to punch into the halo of material that surrounds the galaxy. This Hubble image of galaxy NGC 1068 shows a similar scenario occurring. Previous observations by Hubble and other telescopes found evidence that the Milky Way's black hole had an outburst about two to four million years ago that was energetic enough to create an immense pair of bubbles towering above our galaxy that glow in gamma rays. Hubble was used to see how fast the bubbles were expanding and what they were made of. Hubble later found that the burst was so powerful that it lit up a gaseous structure as far away as 200,000 light years from the galactic center. Called the Magellanic Stream, seen here in pink, this gas is still glowing from that event even today. The residual jet feature is close enough to the black hole that it would become much more prominent only a few decades after the Milky Way's black hole powers up again. Whenever that does actually end up happening, it's sure to be quite a spectacular show. Well, we're back. I um, uh, hope those, uh, uh, those videos were in, uh, informative. The, the solar filter video was back from 2017. I probably should redo it. Um, but I think it gives, uh, gives you the uh, safety information that you need. Um, the reason why I made that video was that we had a, an amateur astronomer who owned one of our larger telescopes. and he calls our customer service department and asks us, can I use my eclipse glasses to look through my telescope? And uh, wow, <laughs> that was like a five alarm uh, uh, emergency for me. And I immediately went out with my iPhone and shot that. So, but um, uh, anyways, uh, uh, the Astronomical League often refers back to that particular video and now that we're getting closer and closer to the annular eclipse in 2020, you know, this year, um, in October, uh, you know, we're going to have to really spread the word about safety because we want everybody to be protected, but we want them to see something amazing, uh, which you will. Um, so, but uh, our next speaker here is uh, Marcello Souza. Marcello is the editor of Skies Up magazine. He is a cosmologist. Uh, he's a professor of astronomy and physics uh, down in Brazil. Uh, he is also an amazing individual who does incredible outreach events, uh, attracting tens of thousands of people. His uh, special forte is getting youth involved in astronomy and space exploration. They've done everything from uh, you know, helping to set up uh, the, South America's first dark sky park to making CubeSats to uh, doing sidewalk astronomy. Uh, so, you know, really just an amazing individual uh, running an amazing program. Uh, Marcello, thank you for coming on to the 111th Global Star Party. Scott, thank you very much for the invitation, for your kind words. Uh, you have a uh, now we are in holidays here in Brazil. Well, it's summer for us, but uh, even I'm trying to share my even during the holidays, we are organizing activities. Mm -hmm.
I would touch uh, here. Here is our astronomy club. The logo for some. I am trying to share the on a moment. My computer is not so. Oh, it's fine. It looks okay, good. But I'm trying to share to change the the page. Oh, on this. A ah, okay. <laughs> here okay, we go. Now, now here we are in Brazil. It's very hot today here, but it's raining a lot here also. No? Then we have a time here in Rio de Janeiro, the state where we, we live, and the location of our city that is far from the the capital of the state. No? It's Campos Great Acas. And it now is what you have in Brazil. <laughs> here in our region, in many places in Brazil, a lot of people at the beach, I was at the beach last week well, for a few moments, but we began the activities uh, near the beach, uh, organizing activities with support of a city near us here, that's San Francisco de Itabapana. Here you have two members of our astronomy club here, Robson and the Ed, that are responsible to organize the events. And here is the red of the Department of Education of the city that is supporting the activities there. And we had a lot of kids that participate in this first activity that happened 10 days ago. And uh, two, two days, uh, last Saturday, three days now, we were invited to organize again. We are, our team was composed by Robson and Kezia. And we, we involved a lot of kids yeah, to make observation, have exhibitions there also. With the, this was produced by the International Astronomic Union. It's a box uh, made by Junawe, Universal Readiness, that you have information about the planets, model of the planets. Yes. And the, we organize an exhibition. And also, we have the opportunity to see Jupiter, Venus, Saturn. It was fantastic, fantastic experience, experience in the spirit. And the, now I, I will remember this image that uh, I saw again this two days ago. And uh, for me, it's a, a spe very special moment for us in astronomy. That is the first image that you had of uh, a solar a outer solar system, a, a system like our solar system from a star. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a fantastic image that for me, for me was a special moment for us. Is an image from ISO, uh, VLT. It's a sun-like star. It is located 300 light years from Earth. And it was the first direct look at a multi-planet system. Then is a, a fantastic image that uh, uh, I saw again last two days ago. And uh, I don't know if uh, all of you remember of this announcements, but uh, until today, for me, is a fantastic moment for us uh, that uh, we have a maze of a star with two planets orbiting the star. Beautiful. That, uh, uh, this is something fantastic. Here, again, is the image. Uh, we have only two planets. The other are stars here in the maze. It's uh, orbiting the, this star. This is fantastic. Now, we, we have a lot of information about the planets orbiting uh, extrasolar right? stars, but uh, it is the first one if, if we hear an image that shows us these, these planets orbiting a star. And this, that is fantastic for now. You were talking about the, the observation of the sun. It's a special moment now. We can see we have a, sun, a big sunspot that is the size of four Earths in the surface of the sun. And we can see with naked eye using a protective system to, to look to the sky, to, to the sun. These are using solar glass. And this is something very special for this moment. And we are expecting that we have a coronal, a coronal mass ejection from this sunspot and the, is in the direction of the Earth. Let us see what we are going to happen. Man. 
but it is a fantastic image again uh, that you can see with uh, naked eye use of solar glass to uh, need to be protected to see. Uh, and here are the images uh, of this big sunspot. Here is the Earth scale. This image is from the spaceweather.com, the homepage. That's a fantastic homepage for who wants to follow what is happening in, with the sun uh, and in the sun. Yeah. Here again, the, we have a lot of sunspots. We are near the peak of the, the solar cycle. Very and the, you need to be protected. <laughs> I hope you don't have a, a big coronal mass ejection, but I think that the, you have a, a big possibility that this can happen. Uh, it's a very big one. Uh, and so in the spot, this is something. Ah, uh, before I talk, I found an article in the Washington Post. That's something for me that is amazing because is is a. I don't know how that. I think that everybody knows the United States is newspaper, but it, uh, an article in the Washington Post about the solar flares. So this is something that shows that uh, many people want to know about uh, what is happening with the sun. Yeah. And this weekend, we have a special event that is the conjunction between Venus and Saturn. And it's something that I think that uh, would be fantastic. Right? I don't know if it's possible. If uh, we can receive images from worldwide from the people that take pictures of these events. We will try here in Brazil because it is near the horizon for us, uh, but it, it will be fantastic. Here are the, both here, Venus and Saturn. And uh, I saw today, you know, Venus is very bright, Jupiter also, and Saturn is coming close to Venus. That's something fantastic. Okay, please. Will this be visible throughout the entire yes. world, northern and southern hemispheres? Yes, yes. Awesome. I'll do it. Thank you. You need one to find the Venus. <laughs> you find the <laughs> Venus, right. you are going to find Saturn near the Venus. And it'll be fantastic. Né? For us here in Brazil, it's only, I think that's how the world will be only the beginning of the night because it's near the sun. Né? Venus is near the sun, then to be in the here. Because here, I think that from 6 to 7 p.m. for us, it will be the, a good moment to see. Yeah. I saw today, you know, and Venus, and it is fantastic in the night sky, in the beginning mm -hmm. of the night sky. Is it a crescent right now? I don't know the phase that the Venus is now. I didn't see with telescopes. Oh, okay, sorry. With a naked eye. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Come on, you, got, eye. you saw the crescent naked eye. I would say that you have yeah. incredible eyesight. Yeah. Yeah. Glasses. But I, I really don't know what is the phase. No? And uh, this is fantastic. And I hope that's a good moment to, to receive uh, pictures no? from many places in the world of this conjunction. No? I don't know, for the next edition, maybe, of the Skies Up report. That is a very special event. And I think that many people will be looking at this you know, in the sky. Then we are, we are here preparing to, to see this. You know? And uh, I, I believe, I hope the sky help us to see this event. You know? And it will be fantastic. And we are... Uh, Organize our 15 international meeting of astronomy and so on. We'll help you. It's a date. Uh, sorry, it's too wrong the date here. I'm sorry. It's a 20. Well, I think that I made a mistake here. Sorry. This is, this is not the correct date. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> use the uh, uh, old one. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I, but it is at the end of April, 2023. Everybody will be very welcome here in Brazil. We organize a very special moment here. And Scott, yes. 
could I, I, I show the the cover of the new edition of absolutely Star absolutely okay. you're the editor <laughs> and uh, this is the next the new edition né, of Sky's app né? that soon will be available oh the, wow uh, at the home page is a fantastic one né? yes you have many Beautiful special cover. yes many special articles né? and it will be launched I think that it, soon né? it is right that soon will be available to everybody and you have many special we have an article from Kurdistan né? Hmm. You know what's happening in Kurdistan. That's a friend, Azi, who wrote an article about what they are doing in Kurdistan, in Iraq, yes. part of Iraq. We have articles from India, from Morocco. From all over the world. Yeah, many different countries. I, 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 I forgot some. Ah, from Romania. Romania. And uh, from United States, from Brazil, <laughs> then it's a uh, it's amazing a magazine that uh, will be available soon to everybody. Uh, and thank you very much, Scott, for the opportunity. And uh, it will be great if you have uh, a special activity for the conjunction. Uh, maybe you have uh, some live event, or I don't know if someone share the images. That's the good because it, it will be fantastic, man. right? It's only hey, idea. Marcello, thank you so much. Thank you, it's my so pleasure. Much for thank you on. very much for the invitation. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to actually read through the final uh, uh, version of Skies Up. You know, we do assemble it here and stuff, but it's Marcello that gets all the contributors from all over the world and uh you know so it's 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 a privilege to be able to play a small role in in getting that magazine put out there it's absolutely free uh to subscribe to and um uh all you have to do is go to explorescientific.com forward slash skies up and um and you can get your free copies um our next speaker is uh, is Cesar Barolo. Cesar down in Argentina, uh, and uh, he is on his balcony looking at southern skies. So we're going to turn it over to Cesar. Thank you for coming on. Hi, Scott. How are you? How are you, Good. everyone? It's a pleasure tonight, starting uh, in my first uh, global safari presentation this year. Um, um, yes, like Maxi, uh, we enjoy it in the end of the of the uh, of the year, uh, the the cam the championship, uh, the championship of uh, the world championship of <laughs> Argentina. <laughs> um, yes, yes, we started very, very uh, happy the year. Absolutely. Um, well, tonight I use him uh, explore scientific uh, first light eighty with uh, eighty refractor eighty millimeters refractor. Um, uh, I was pointing. I I was taking taking picture of Eta Carina Nebula. Mm. Um, I try to process something. Uh, without darks, only only to 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 have the experience in in a very simple in a very simple steps to have some integration of of the image. Um, well, let me share a screen if I have the opportunity to to make some something i i use the most simple program the free program that is a deep sky stacker because something that i need to tonight something that i need to to know if i have some integration i took pictures 95 pictures of um of uh, eta carina nebula each 
uh, image is uh, 10 seconds uh, because it's an unguided picture. And I took uh, 10 seconds with 400 ISO using an old reflex camera. Let me check if you can see the setup. Very simple, very simple. The EXS 100, mm -hmm. the mode that that in the first time, Explore Scientific don't uh, design it for astrophotography, but all people using for astrophotography. And this is something great because it's, I, I felt the same when I started to sell this this month in, in our store. And I, I know that that was the same, was something that, let me check where I have. I will stop share because I need to, this is a real live experience. Sorry that, that, that I don't have, let me check if I have where, okay. Well, this I will share again. You can, and you can see my, the mess that I have in my in my desktop. Okay. Well, first of all. I'm going to ah, okay. Well, the first thing that is very important for to say for the people is remember where you have the pictures <laughs> not like me yes <laughs> okay well i'll share again here we go again yeah sorry no problem well it looks like it's not too windy which is unusual uh yes the wind tonight i we have a um a four uh, cast of um of strong wind but is from the opposite side of this building this ah because tonight is very very clear and it's it's okay that's great yes well first of all only I choose, I go to desktop and okay. This is very, very, very simple. I have the I choose a, a quantity number. Oh, of, I see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I will select all. And um, well, I will start to. Well, I, I, I choose the 95 pictures. I think that it will be very, very fast. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's something that is a live experience. Now, the, the, this program See, is sir, something. Yeah, a, tell me. A question I have is uh, how long did it, I mean, what is your setup like? How long does it take for you to get set up with your astrophotography uh, equipment and everything on your patio? Yeah, 
the first the first is uh make a um polar alignment of your uh, water and mom the best that you can get um for me for example is something that that is something that everybody can make the the same it's take marks or a or how do you say marks in the floor or uh, some um, uh, reference point where you put your tripod and you can have the first thing where you can get the the azimuth position for the south or the north states or north hemisphere um, and the idea is sometimes uh, when you have your best position of uh, latitude, um, keep the, the position, of course, that in your patio, in your balcony, you uh, you, you don't uh, leave the telescope outside. Um, you don't have an, an uh, observatory, but in this kind of small telescopes, you have the the possibility of have the position for your equatorial mount that every night that you use the most accurate or near to your polar alignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I sorry I I telling about what about a first level telescope because my idea is show this kind of telescope where you have maybe a motor equatorial maybe a not go to i don't use the go to to uh, this night uh think that for example this is why because many people say okay no but you have a very very complicated mount or you know but the mostly uh, objects in the sky are very very easy to find in the sky and you don't need a go to of course that if you if it are for a go to mount um the, the two particularities that where you have the amount that is go to is going to to find the object that you need to, to point and tracking the object that you need to make an exposure and you have a, a, a two uh, points um, uh, for win a better a better uh, picture. But the most important part of, of the picture is not the go-to, if not the tracking. The go-to mm -hmm. is really a, a helping to, to put the, the telescope to the right object, absolutely. But for maybe 20, the 21st bright objects that you can make a picture, you can use a first light telescope without go-to for example, the AQ3, and mm. uh, with a motor in the rec as rec ascension, and you have uh, something that is great for, you know, for for your uh, first first picture of the sky. In this in this um, example, in my my balcony, actually using uh, the Exos 100. Um, something that if you, if you, for example, you don't need, you don't need make the tree stars alignment each night because uh, this mount have naturally the position and uh, of all the stars and um, for example, uh, if you put in the same position each night that you start to use the telescope, you can go to the, the catalog instead uh, make the three star alignments and maybe with the first star that you choose you uh, you press sync for example tonight i use a churnar i use a churnar to synchronize um i and uh when i choose eta carina Eta Carina, the telescope was 
uh, was um, to the Eta Carina really, really very near to the star, to the to the nebula. Hmm. And this is a great, a great experience because you have two two points uh, to win a great experience. Um, first one is that you are making the best um, polar alignment for a simple telescope and not wider telescope. We are talking about make the things samples very first level and uh, this is the setup where you are thinking in make something you know uh with a small mount with a motor with a first level telescope that is really great and you have uh the option of um you know of uh to have in this in this uh, option in this um, equipment something go to, but uh, you don't need uh, uh, the mod the models that are go to to starting. Many people I told to many people that choose the 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 option uh, without the go to, and if when you you feel confident. <laughs> to to buy a mount, uh, go to mount. You will have you are having a, a better solutions for you to to to, um, to find new objects in the sky. Um, it's really this is a, I I don't know if I, I was uh, clear with the the setup of of the or of, of the steps of the balcony or how choosing equipment for for places like the city where where do you have uh, something that you can carry uh, completely assembled to your living room and going outside and putting your balcony or your patio and you have something that take pictures with an old reflex camera that you can you can uh, find like a bargain in, in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent refractor, 80 millimeter telescope, first light telescope, and uh, a uh, um, first light mount with motor or EXS 100 with motor. Maybe it's the best solution. It's very small. It's something that, that you when you see your telescope in your living room completely assembled, you say, okay, tonight I go to outside to use the telescope. And if you put the marks in the floor where you can put the telescope, if you have the same position from the last time, maybe you can choose in each exposition, maybe 10, 15 seconds that are totally enough Totally enough to make a uh, um, a good uh, integration for a, a great image. I'll try now. Maybe we are stacking fifty over seventy-seven. Maybe it will be a disaster or something good. I don't know. But it's so <laughs> easy that he <laughs> has. While Maxi um, and uh, uh, Marcello spoke about the different things in astronomy. I was taking yeah. the pictures and, and and I started. I was taking the pictures and um, and now I started to you know you you, you watch me starting to 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 stack the pictures that now we are uh, awaiting how it will be the quality of integration of the image. I don't know. <laughs> because I, I don't put the darks. Normally the darks are for mm -hmm. uh, substract or uh, the, the noise of the camera, of this cam camera sensor. But as uh, I use it, 400, 400 ISO for this camera, okay. the level of noise is very low and you can use 
something that I can, I can explain to the people that love to start astronomy, uh, astrophotography especially, uh, is something that you need to know your camera and you need to know the the sweet point if you're in, in your camera where is the best the best situation uh for for this the sensor of your camera this is very very great i don't know let me check we are finished <laughs> you, you you can you can uh read see, okay I think that this this is uh, ta -ta -ta <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it will be a disaster. <laughs> <or> don't <laughs> well, don't apologize till we see it. <laughs> yeah, yes, but this is the magic. I'm sure, it's going to be fine. I love to share. Okay, here we go. You know, sorry, by my apologies because it's. It's very fast. I'll I'll make this one later for for you know this is the best position. This is very it's so is it is it not a great software, but it's so great when kids or many many people started with this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can start to see the nebulosity. Yes, yes. And we can... Now, this is just so everybody knows. I mean, if you if you haven't watched Global Star Party before and you don't know uh, much about uh, where where uh, Caesar is, he's in the middle of the city of Buenos Aires. In, uh, yes. Uh, right? It's very light polluted uh, where he is. Uh, he's on the... He's in his apartment uh, on his balcony making these images. And uh, one of the things that he really inspires people to do is to do, it doesn't matter where you are, okay? You don't have to wait for perfect skies or the perfect conditions or whatever. You can do astronomy for almost anywhere, you know? And um, certainly the more astronomy that you do, no matter what your conditions are, you know, the better you become more skilled. And so that that is... Um, yeah, I think that's the the great message that Caesar delivers here. Look at this. I mean, he's getting uh, nice nebulosity and um... yeah. And if you if you see each here, no fancy processing you here, right? Sure. And you have and you have something that is real. You can see, you know, the nebulous. The look, dates. Maybe it's. It's too hard, but you can show an evolucity to me with a safest, a soft, a soft, a soft curve. Yeah, and the first light 80 millimeter refractor is not, uh, it's not an APO, you yes. know, it's, it is a, um, uh, mm -hmm. an affordable range. Uh, telescope for most beginners uh, to get involved with and you're doing a great job with it Caesar so thank you oh and what it, it, what camera it's it's an old uh, it's an old uh three three hundred fifty d eos okay. canon eos from from eight years ago oh wow and now of course that i i of course that I try to to make the something with the, you know, with the um, the histogram to show now. But of course that that later I'll I'll prepare the I'll prepare the uh, um, I make the the darks and yes. the flats okay. to make a, a decent picture. So this was just raw images coming through. Yeah. Did it live? Thank you very much, Caesar. That's uh, great. It, it, Thank you. It, it, it's a total. It's a total pleasure, really. Yeah. Really. It's, it's nice to see it's, objects from. It's a live. It's, it's something live, and yes. it's uh, totally. 
totally, you know, something that it's to share um, to us all all night we have because tonight we have yeah. results about a nebula that it's maybe 15,000 uh, like years maybe I don't know I don't remember Eta uh, Karina but and you have something imagine for for a kid if you are making this for your son your daughter you know we are the experiment it will be maybe took half hour totally a little more i i i took i took only um 195 image of 10 second each it was very easy very very fast and the magic uh that you can show uh, oh thank you S -se seven thousand five hundred Thank you, Scott. <laughs> yes, the, the middle, I, I, yes, I, I thought. I get but, these numbers wrong too. So but, yeah, thank you. But thank it's you. far. It's still far. <laughs> and in a in a sky where you can see nothing, right? And with a small telescope, tell me about magic. This is magic. Is technology going to to be crazy? And it's right. something that when when you talk. With, to the people that you can make this is is really it's fantastic thank, thank you so much. sorry thank you Caesar. i long for thank my you. long presentation but was a live was not a, 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 it a, was a, live yes live sir. experiment was <laughs> i'm gonna ask a question in the chat okay don't go away don't go away just yet <laughs> okay okay while you guys are chatting i'm going to introduce uh uh, Douglas Arion, uh, he is a um, uh, professor emeritus at Carthage College, but that just, I mean, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of what this guy is. He is, he is uh, an incredible outreach individual. Uh, I kind of learned a little bit about him uh, during the International Year of Astronomy when he and a team of other people got involved in building what became known as one of the cornerstone projects of the International Year of Astronomy, the Galileo Scope. And uh, uh, we're proud to be the makers of the, Gal the Galileo Scope at this time. Um, but uh, that telescope has a, uh, has a long story. It has uh, uh, been used in classrooms all over the world. Uh, and, um, you know, so if that was just kind of the end of Doug's story, that would be amazing all by itself, but uh, he, has, um, he has a program called um, uh, Mountains of Stars, which I will share the, uh, uh, the link to his website. Um, you know, they, they do amazing educational outreach through that program. Uh, you know, and anybody would be very, very fortunate to have uh, Doug himself uh, teaching you uh, about the universe and about physics. I imagine that he is uh, uh, one of the most gifted educators around. So thank you very much for coming on to Global Star Party, Doug. Well, thanks, Scott. That's that's quite an introduction. I really appreciate that. That was exceedingly complimentary. Um, I'll share my screen here and uh, share the proper screen that should work there we go um yeah so so briefly um uh, i've been very concerned about how people treat the environment and so i launched mountains of stars about 12 years ago hmm. um and what what we intend to do is what we call environmental awareness from a cosmic perspective we use astronomy to connect people with the environment and it's great because you know everybody loves astronomy uh, and of course, it's the study of everything. So it, it, it's the perfect link. You can talk about absolutely anything in nature by having astronomy um, as the basis for that. Um, and uh, most summers we have undergraduate students who work with us and we train them in science communications. We do all sorts of programs all over the Northeast. Um, we have telescopes, uh, our, our big partners, the Appalachian Mountain Club, we have telescopes at every one of their facilities from New Jersey up to Maine. 
one of the big things we accomplished over the last couple of years was to create the first international dark sky park in New England. Uh, mm -hmm. We now have 100,000 acres in northern Maine that is protected. Wow. And not only is it protected, but there are beautiful lodges. There's uh, Meadow Whistle Lodge, Gorman Chairback Lodge, Little Lyford Lodge and cabins. So mm -hmm. beautiful cabins and lodges that have great food, terrific uh, hiking, paddling, um, nature watching. And we have telescopes and the only dark sky east of the Rockies in the United States. And it's accessible. I mean, if you live anywhere in the eastern seaboard, you're only a few hour drive. And, you know, a day within a day's drive could be a long drive, but within a day's drive, you can easily be up in Maine and have a truly, truly wonderful dark sky. So That's awesome. um, I urge everyone to go up there and, and experience it because there are so few places you can go in this country, um, especially one where you can have such you know, wonderful accommodations. Um, this evening, though, I'd like to talk about uh, what Scott was mentioning, which is Galileo scope, um, and uh, tell you a bit about where it came from and where we're at and a wonderful opportunity for everybody. Um, so, you know, here's a beautiful night sky, and, and this is what we wish everybody saw and everybody was connected with. And um, in 2009 was held the International Year of Astronomy. And um, there were these cornerstone projects. The, the goal was obviously to connect everybody with the sky and everybody with astronomy around the world, not just in the States, but around the world. And somebody uh, had this idea that, well, people should have a telescope to be able to look at the sky, which seems to me to be a brilliant idea, right? Now, all of us love telescopes and want to do that. Um, but we're talking about everybody around the world, not just, you know, rich people in the United States and Western Europe. We want everybody to have a telescope. And um, I got involved with this with Rick Feinberg, who was with the American Astronomical Society uh, and several others. And um, we got samples of pretty much every low cost telescope made. And frankly, they were terrible. It's very hard to find a low cost telescope that was also any good. So we committed to making our own. And so it was an interesting process because um, uh, I came into it, I, I'm a really odd duck in that I make telescopes. I, I'm a professional astronomer and, and physicist, but I've also worked in economic development and, and business consulting. And so I already had um, partners who could do manufacturing and could do distribution and handle the financial and so on. So we put this team together and engineered um, this wonderful uh, uh, product, and um, we started making them. And this happened in you know 2008 into 2009, when the world financial markets kind of collapsed. And so um, Rick Feinberg and I put in our own money to actually make the tooling and produce these, uh, and we started selling them around the world. Um, so uh, that was a very big push for the IYA. And then in 2015, there was the International Year of Light. So we continued uh, the Galileo scope project uh, year upon year. And over the course of the you know, decades since we started this, over 270,000 are now in use in 110 countries. Wow. And during the IYA, we had a buy one, give one program. So we were able to send an entire container of over 7,000 Galileo scopes to South Africa uh, for distribution for free to kids throughout South Africa. Uh, it, it's been uh, quite a tremendous, um, a tremendous program. Now, um, we have done these and used these with audiences, frankly, of all ages. Uh, these are pictures actually of a workshop I just did um, this fall at a charter school in, in central New Hampshire, where all of these kids put together their own Galileo scopes. Um, so you can see the, uh, at the left there, even little, little kids can put these things together and you have a telescope that's really very high quality. And it's a way to connect, not just to connect them with the telescope, but this is something they can keep forever and continue to use. Right. And um, they've been used in a, a number of um, interesting and different ways there. So on the left uh, there, there's Brad Vigi. Um, he's part of the Northeast Kingdom Astronomy Foundation and We've been doing programs for their kids and their schools. Um, at the bottom center there, there, there was a gentleman who uh, took many cases of these to Tanzania and gave them out to kids you know, wow. in, in, in villages across that country. 
which was which was pretty uh, pr pretty cool. Um, and there they get used. Um, and then at the other extreme, people have taken Galileo scopes and made all sorts of interesting things out of them. So here's an example of somebody who built a finder and auto guider, because where where are you going to find a 50 millimeter telescope for you know the price of a Galileo scope uh, if you're building up a finder and and uh, astro imaging system? So right. uh, people have done all sorts of really really cool things with them, which, which I think is is pretty wild. Now, um, this these have been great. We've been putting them out. They've been used for education everywhere from kids up through college. Um, individuals have bought them. We think they're absolutely the very best Christmas present you can give somebody of any age because you can introduce them to astronomy. They can put the kit together, learn how telescopes work, observe the sky. But um, here in North America, we have wonderful things happening this coming year, which are the two eclipses, the annular eclipse uh, in 23 and the total eclipse uh, in 24. But one of the important things for us to get across to people is, sure, if you're in those two paths, you get to see the annular and total patterns, but the entire country gets a partial eclipse. And that's where you most need uh, a capability uh, of watching it. Uh, and this is a great simulation that somebody put out. That larger circle, that's the shadow of any part of the moon on the sun. So anything inside that bigger circle gets the partial eclipse in 24, which you can see is basically all of North America except for Western Alaska and all of Central America as well. So this is, this is a tremendous opportunity to be able to connect people with astronomy uh, and the sky and the sun. But what do you need? Um, you need a telescope that is safe to use with the sun. So uh, these are pictures of uh, an eclipse trip I ran back in 2017, and we had piles and piles of telescopes, all with safe solar filters and Herschel wedges. But what we'd really like to do is to let people do that with a Galileo scope. So um, since Scott has taken over production of Galileo scopes, which has been tremendous because Rick and I were running this on our own for many years, uh, and Scott's capability to produce these and distribute them is, is so much greater than what we can do. So we're, we're super excited uh, that he's put the effort in to take this on. Uh, but we work together to come up with a safe solar filter and a, a solar screen um, that people can use to use Galileo scopes to safely look at the sun. So um, just as Marcello mentioned before, you know, the sun has a lot of activity now. We don't even have to wait for the eclipses. Uh, the sun is going to be a great thing to be looking at in the next few years. But for these eclipses, uh, this is, I, I, I can't imagine really a better thing to put in the hands of people um, to be able to watch the eclipse. You can see it close up and you can watch it safely uh, through all of the partial phases, uh, wherever you are from, you know, almost the Panama Canal all the way up through Northern Canada. Now, mm. One of the great things about this is um, they've done tremendous work at Explore to be able to offer these uh, very inexpensively in large blocks. And so our, our goal is that educational institutions, museums, science centers, astronomy clubs, um, national education organizations, state education organizations, will acquire these and distribute them and get them into the hands, especially of kids across the entire country. I mean, think about how many fourth graders there are in the country alone. There are about 4 million fourth graders in the country. Wouldn't it be great if every one of those kids had this tremendous tool, not just for the eclipse, but to watch the sun at any time and to look at the sky every single night? I, I think that would be um, absolutely um, terrific. So um, we've arranged to be able to take pre-orders so that production can be uh, begun. Um, so um, you can contact us uh, through the Galileo Scope site, which you can see here. Uh, it's also linked on the Mountains of Stars site that Scott is uh, sending you the link to so that you can uh, get uh, information there or directly um, through Explore. So other things that we're going to do, um, Obviously, those who get these, especially organizations that are going to distribute them, are going to need training, some help to be able to get many people to put these together and use them safely. So we are planning on doing a series of webinars um, this summer 
so that uh, folks can learn how to use Galileo scopes, both for the sun and for nighttime observing. And uh, most importantly, our site at Galileo Scope isn't just about the telescope. Um, there are observing guides and instructions and manuals and all sorts of great information that people can use um, to use their Galileo scopes, observe the sky, and to enjoy the eclipses. So this is all resources that we're making available to everybody around the world. Uh, and we hope that um, they will take advantage of this um, and do that. Also on the Mountains of Stars website, uh, in addition to obviously a link to the Galileo scope, uh, we have a lot of really cool nature and astronomy resources. So uh, I hope that you'll go to the site and use what's there. There are um, uh, TED Talks, podcasts, videos of all sorts of different kinds, links to books, articles, uh, an entire library of resources um, of really cool stuff about astronomy and the natural world. Um, so please take a look at that. Please use that uh, for yourselves. Share it with families, with, with educators, with schools, with anybody um, who is doing really cool and interesting nature education. We make all of that available uh, to you there. So um, I will stop sharing my screen and um, be happy to give you any more information you'd like about it. Um, but uh, Scott and I wanted to make sure that everybody knew about this opportunity um, because it, it's really, it's really, really cool and, and a great thing. And uh, just to show you, here's a Galileo scope right here that we have available to you and uh, the package for it. It's a really terrific thing. I hope you will uh, help spread the word um, to organizations you knew, you, uh, uh, you know, high schools, colleges, science centers astronomy clubs, and even yourselves to buy a block and, and give them as gifts to, to kids in your neighborhood. Um, it's a way we can help get everybody connected with this guy. Right. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm on the Mountains of Stars uh, website right now, and a uh, ton of great information on this website as well. Um, so, uh, and of course, there is a link to for inquiries for the uh, Galileo scope with the special uh, solar filters. So, um, you definitely want to uh, tune into that, especially if you're an educator uh, or if you run uh, any kind of community programs. And, you know, you've already heard on, global, on the 111th Global Star Party about how astronomy can change people's lives. Um, you know, we had, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, heard everything from, you know, homeless people turning their lives around to... Uh, uh, people that, uh, even ourselves, that are uh, have been in amateur astronomy or, in the case of Doug, professional astronomy, there's something about looking up at the sky and finding uh, something that uh, connects you. And uh, it really is kind of a, uh, uh, a healing effect. I know that uh, Doug and Rick and his whole team have... You know, when you take like a quarter of a million people building their own telescope, looking up at the sky, exploring and going on that journey, they those people are touching thousands more each one, you know, in, in effect, you know. So uh, I can imagine, you know, if we could do some sort of visualization of how many people were affected by astronomy as it went around the world, uh, you know, I think that it's... Uh, it's amazing, you know, and uh, and it's it's creating um, uh, growth in uh, the tech environments. It's creating growth in education. Uh, we are, you know, we have many large scale problems that uh, humanity has to face. But you know what? They're gonna they're gonna face it and solve it with science. That's what's going to happen. And. Um, you know, the doorway to the gateway to get there uh, for a lot of people is through uh, an astronomy experience. And uh, Doug, uh, you have been a, a great leader in that and you continue to be. And, uh, you know, we can, it'll be exciting and very interesting to know how many more people get turned on to it uh, during these eclipses that are coming up. Yeah, you know, the eclipses are a tremendous opportunity. Uh, throughout North America. And, and the other thing is, you know, there are eclipses around the world. I mean, for us here, because we happen to be in the States, this is a big deal for us. But, 
you know, the, the, there are eclipses in other places in the future, you know, in the next couple of years. So, the, you know, whether it's the good eclipse glasses or solar capable Galileo scopes, those are going to be useful throughout the world, you know. Uh, so thank you for the kind words. But yeah, I really do believe that astronomy is the best way and the most straightforward way to get people connected with science and, and the environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, so check out his website. And uh, if you haven't already bought it, a Galileo scope, you know, what are you waiting for? So, <laughs> right. So thank you so much, Doug. Thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. Thanks a lot, Scott. It was fun. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, we had uh, John Schwartz who was supposed to be on, uh, and he may come on later. But right now we're going to go over to Nepal uh, uh, to bring back in DT Gautam. Uh, DT, thank you so much for uh, coming on to uh, Global Star Party. It's been a while. It's been months since you've been on, and uh, we're really happy and pleased to have you. Uh, hello, Scott, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's me, Dipti Gautam. And today, uh, I'm going to give the presentation uh, regarding the theme. Uh, let's go through the theme first, and I will explain the region behind the uh, gap between uh, months early, uh, of this program. Uh, so let's go through this. Uh, connecting the theme uh, based on the life, uh, dreaming of something happening in the dark indicates that you are going to experience a period of darkness per se and some bad things are going to come your way and postpone your success on the basis of life you need to try and get rid of things that are bringing you down on the other hand the night school represents the darkness which denotes the end of everything if you see the sun rising uh it's it's obvious that you are going to see the light and make a fresh start so based on the theme i connect candle in the darkness to the beautiful sparkling star of night mm. sky, that's darkness. Uh, stars, uh, star is an uh, astronomical object comprising a luminous spread of plasma held together by its gravity. And the nearest star of the Earth is the sun, or we know that. And some of the brightest star of the sky are Cyrus, Vega, Betelgeuse, etc. And stars are huge celestial bodies made mostly of hydrogen and helium that produce light and heat. Uh, from the turning nuclear force inside the cores. And some stars shine more brightly than others. And the brightness is a factor of how much energy they put out known as luminosity and how far away from the Earth they are. And color can also vary from star to star uh, because their temperature are not all the same. Uh, hot star appears white or blue, whereas a uh, cooler star appears to have orange or red. And... Uh, most of the stars in our galaxy, including the Sun, are categorized as main sequence stars. And they exist in a stable state of nuclear fusions, uh, converting hydrogen to helium and radi radiating X-rays. And this process emits an enormous amount of energy, keeping the star hot and shining brightly. And that's how I connect the uh, candles in the dark. And I found some of the interesting facts uh, about the star. And most star travels the galaxy with uh, companion or in clusters, but not all the stars do that. Our sun, for example, moves through the galaxy without a stellar companion. Uh, when and another is when we, you look at a star or any other uh, in a space, you are seeing how it looked in the past. And the sun appears was it was 8.5 minutes ago. And the more massive star, the shorter its lifespan is. A um, very massive star may live only a sort of time, while a cool draft will shine for billions of years. At an age of about 4.5 billion years, our sun is considered as the middle age star. And this is how uh, connecting with the themes and uh, uh, giving the answer of uh, uh, being taking a gap, a uh, long gap. I was involved in uh, a different kind of outreach program uh, here in Nepal. Uh, through the uh, Nepal Astronomical Society, uh, being involved in Nepal Astronomical Society. So I'd like to uh, screen, share my screen. Please do. So here is. So uh, I met his outreach diary. 
and it was fun involving uh in the outreach program uh, throughout this uh, month and uh this is the program i conducted in the one of the remote area of nepal uh, uh i have uh, my uh, it's a of telescope, which is 76 mm telescope, uh, which is a resource from uh, the office actually from the Nepal Astronomical Society. And uh, this was the program uh, which I conducted in my high school uh, where I studied, uh, where I completed my high school. And uh, actually, we named it as an astrophysicist, uh, where we conducted about the making this. A uh, model of rocket and uh, solar observations, plus um, uh, making a model of uh, solar, uh, like making the model of uh, solar systems, and making the model of how the eclipse work, and different things and different kind of funds. Uh, plus, uh, this is the uh, here is the kids. Uh, we are excited to see the sun through the telescope. <clears throat> this is the beautiful view from the upside of the hill of. From Nepal is the when the sunset. Uh, actually, I want to say the sunset view uh, from the upside hills. And uh, this was the uh, one of the school, uh, high school from uh, Nepal, which was on the up off side of the hill. Uh, which uh, we nearly uh, walked for one one point five hour uh, to go there. Uh, actually, we did a trekking for this, and we reached out there and uh, conducted our programs. And in these programs, we conducted our solar observations and plus uh, uh, constellation viewer. Uh, we, uh, I made a constellation viewer, uh, so it uh, made uh, easy to student to understand the, how constellation looks like. And mm. uh, and also, uh, I conducted, uh, I made them understand how the rocket work, the mechanism of the rocket. So here uh, we can see the student uh, catching the paper rocket. That's just a model, and I showed them how the paper rocket, uh, how the rocket actually work for. That's cool. And uh, this was the uh, my friend and me uh, conducted of uh, like uh, making through the solar glasses observation and uh, discussion with the student and uh, showing the uh, little kid uh, the sun. It was really fun. And uh, their curiosity was a different level, and it was fun seeing them. And uh, it's enjoyable my, for myself. And this is what a constellation viewer I made. Uh, I reflect the constellation viewer in the white background. And uh, this is how I saw them, the constellation. And uh, that's the, some clips uh, where I have been involved for the last few months. And uh, it's, I think uh, I conducted a nearly five, six outreach program in different places. And that's how I, uh, I was unable to give my time for the Global Star Party. And similarly, it's been a long time and I created some poem, a small poem. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, candle in the, uh, based on the theme, uh, uh, Candle in the Dark. Hey, enthusiast heart, the darkness of night sky seems to be beautiful than everything which actually enlightened our heart and in our soul. The star in the sky, sky symbolizes a candle in the deep darkness of beautiful sky. The star helps humans navigate throughout. Candle gives the clear pathway of life. Ups and downs is what the life is. Going to the hills and exploring give different vibes. Stargazing, looking moon, just need a scope and a good times. Then see everything will seems very fine. Then see everything will seems very fine. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deep T. Thank you. I hope to. I've been following you on uh, Facebook, of course, and um, yes. uh, seeing your exploits. And um, uh, it seems that uh, uh, you're having a wonderful life, and uh, uh, you know, and that you're still very, very involved in uh, science outreach. So, thank you for all the great work you're doing. Thank you, Scott. Okay. All right. Okay. So we are going to um, go from Nepal to California, uh, where John Schwartz, who's an old friend of mine, a uh, great amateur astronomer, uh, uh, and also a great artist. And so he combines his passion of giant aperture telescopes and, um, uh, and his ability to uh, uh, illustrate and draw 
the cosmos. And so John's going to share some of his work with us tonight. Thank you for coming on to Global Star Party, John. Hello. Can you hear me, everyone? We hear you. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> I can't hear myself, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just was able to get in. I've been very busy out here in California. The weather has been, you know, extremely rainy. Oh, yeah. Tons of rain. So, yeah, yep. it's been um, hard to do anything other than, you know, stay dry. Yes. So uh, I was enjoying, you know, the moon through the clouds. There were some beautiful evenings where we were able to see the moon come out for a brief moment. And um, so I tried to capture it. So I was going to just start uh, with one of those moon shots that I did. And then I'm also doing a new platform. I'm starting to use my new iPad, which I'm on right now, very which good. I'm very happy about. So let's see if you guys can see that one. Oh, yeah. Now, just to get everybody straight here, John, this is not a photograph, right? This is... No. This, this is, is a drawing. Actually, uh, mostly sketched on my <clears throat> cell phone to get the basic, you know, shape and the position of the clouds. Of course, the clouds are moving rapidly, so the view changes by the minute. So when you get that awe-stricken view, you kind of you know, build the sketch around that. And um, it, it looks you know, very rays, photographic. It looks very yeah. The rays were coming out. I'm not <clears> sure. If, let me uh, let me do one thing. I'm gonna go out of this one. Okay. And um, back in that might have been the wrong one. One of them I put rays because the moonlight it was actually shining. Oh yeah. So you can see a slight. It's not like the sun, but. You know, those little pockets of clear blue sky, the rays would come down and it was just a ray of hope that the skies were clear and I could get some views. You know, Orion <laughs> is positioned quite well right now. So uh, in the early evening, if you don't like staying up all night. So yeah. now you were with us at Mount Wilson uh, on the 60 inch, and I recall. Correct. You were, um, you yeah. were actually doing your work right at the eyepiece is this a is this your typical technique you're at the eyepiece or um well it's a varied approach you know um okay. when you're sketching for forums or you know like a place where you can show your sketches like asad uh, astronomy sketch of the day you know you want to keep it more to the context of a true render you know view and plus my telescope's big so I get a lot more and Wilson is extremely big. So, you know, the only problem with that is if you start sketching a lot, it takes time. And usually they have a, a list of objects and there's a lot of other people that are participating. So it's a little selfish and I'll get kicked off the operators. And then, you know, sometimes they want to keep that to a minimal. So I've got to be quick. Take a, if I'm going to use some cell phone snapshots to get a basic idea, that's about all I can do. You know, I can't sit at the eyepiece and sketch, but that's the beauty of digital and these new cell phones. It just is absolutely amazing what you can accomplish now that you're using, um, you know, and you're not spilling paint all over and your paper isn't getting wet. And if you make a mistake, you just go back one notch and you're right back where you were. So I'll show you my um, other moon shot that I did. So this is after it cleared, of course. And this was just after full moon. Yeah, it and is amazing what you can accomplish, but it, uh, you, are, you are a skilled and talented artist as well. So that's, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, my, my uh, efforts compared to yours will be it's it's um quite easy <laughs> you know what with the digital it's it's amazingly easy <clears throat> because you're not you know overdoing your pages and making it muddy you know typically if you're doing a sketch and you start to build up and you don't get it quite right so you come in with a black and mm. you go over that white and a gray it just makes a, a muddy it has a dull appearance and mm. so with the digital you're really able to you know, get it spot on because you do layers, you know, 
uh, you can do well, the layers, but um, that's my new platform. I'm in, in, a, in a future Global Star Party, we'll have to have you show the technique sometime. Oh, yeah, I want to do it. And then I cool. also want to show you the amazing cell phone, which you can do with it through a 32-inch telescope. And, uh, you know, the new iPhone and the Samsung right. the cameras are amazing in there. And right. if you just do that uh, mode where you're taking, you know, it can actually take up to 30 second exposures, I think, the new ones. Okay. But I mean, in 10 seconds, you've got a basic outline, you know, uh, of your object like Orion. It'll barely come in. You know, the swan will come in really good. There's some objects that work better mm -hmm. than others, especially in the 60 mm -hmm. inch. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the 60. This was a um, one that I did pretty much from the eyepiece. And then my friend had gone up there like five times this year. So he has some good snapshots, a variety of different planetary nebulas. And so he was kind enough. I told him I would help him with some of his, you know, um, processing his cell phone image and then Very cool. sketching them up and cleaning them up and doing what I do. And so uh, I sent him his. Let, and then let me, let me ask you a question, John. I mean, obviously you love drawing and, and you love sketching, but how do you think, I mean, what do you end up with that you think is different or maybe an advantage over someone making an astrophotograph? I mean, is there, is it, do you feel like you're part, uh, you're like, um, touching like there's this creative process where you're you know really engaging you know as you're creating the image is that different than just seeing you know you made this whatever 100 hour exposure or whatever do you think that there's a more tactile kind of engagement uh as an artist oh you know for sure because you know you're looking at the photons coming in and you're trying to capture that faint glow you know and like with the Wilson 60 inch, this is uh, NGC 6826. And this was my uh, best rendering. That's beautiful. And it, it almost floats three dimensionally. And that's the beauty because you see that in the eyepiece of the 60. I mean, as light polluted as it was, you know, on certain planetaries, there is no better view. Oh, that's that. true. That's and if true. that scope was at a dark site, there is nothing that could compare to that telescope. But you know, uh, some of the objects we look at, they're confined to brighter planetaries or, you know, even the planets and some of the open clusters, uh, M13. Hmm. But, you know, some objects aren't worth looking at in there just because it's too powerful. The focal length is too long and it doesn't give you the field of view. So, like, for instance, Orion, you would just look at the core of Orion. Right. I mean, not Orion, uh, M31, excuse me. Oh, M31. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah like they had it into in, a fog was, bank because you're yeah. staring at all these stars. But what you can see, uh, you know, if we go back to the 60 and talking about what you can visually see, you can see globular star clusters. I mean, just no mistake. Oh, yeah, that so, is amazing. So that's it. That yeah. is, uh, we do a, um, uh, John was there, we do an annual uh, Mount Wilson 60 inch star party. And so, for all of you that haven't tried doing something like that, you should definitely do it. You know, it's it is. Uh, yeah, John, have, been there how many it's times? It's open. It's open. Um, there's a if you go online and find the right thing, you can sign up and buy time. And yeah, you can actually reserve the scope for you and some people for you know a certain price, so you get you know enough people to make it. It's, not it's worth bad. it. It's worth it. And, we um, we it, reserve yeah. the scope and, um, you know, and then sell off, you know, tickets for, I think it's like 150 bucks or something like that to go, you know, versus ponying up the money for the whole facility. You know, so. Yeah. And plus you, you do a nice touch cause you have a nice, uh, food and there's a lot of, um, great speakers and, you know, there's yeah, other you were stuff speaker that, there. You were, yeah, speaker. yep. It was, uh, it was an amazing time. And, um, you know, each group, you get a different feel. You know, I was blessed enough to go three times this year. And each one was a different kind of, um, you know, some people are more into taking the photos and because you can't really see that kind of stuff through any telescope anywhere. I mean, when you look at this planetary, so this, this is called the blinker. 
And, you know, in most scopes, it blinks. Even in my 28, it's pretty steady. But when you look here, there's no blinking. It's just there, like dimensional. And, and the central star is just floating. And, and the star colors, you can't see it too well. But <clears throat> I tried to replicate. That's what I was uh, using his photo. It was advantageous of getting some star mm -hmm. positions a little more accurate. Sure. And then um, the color. These colors are true. And it was very intricate to try to get the right size in the paint, you know, because in the 60 inch things have color, you know, that's the beauty. Yeah. And, that, and then like looking at Jupiter and the moons, I mean, you see detail on the moons when that scope steadies in, as you know, there is no better view uh, for the moon, the planets and, oh, yeah. and other things. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've I've really enjoyed my time over there. I'd like to do. I would like to check the hundred inch out maybe one night. <laughs> one night. And and see what um, that has to offer. We digress. It's hard not to get excited about Mount Wilson, but uh, oh. but let's and, let's and, go back to your images, John. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, no okay, problem. So this is another one that I did. So I I've done a lot of Orions, and um, you know it helps me get better and better and better. So sure. each time I do, when I look at it, I go, I think it's great. And then I learn some better techniques and the illumination with the, um, with this uh, backlit screen, it gives you almost like oh, wow. dimension. God, you and know, then, what this reminds me of, this reminds me of like some of Herschel's drawings. I mean, this is beautiful. Yeah. This one um, is my evolved, you know, I had one, I was working from uh the Panamint Valley star gaze, they have a big event out there near past, you know, the desert. I think it's Mojave or death Valley. One of them, it's way out there, you know, and, um, yeah. you know, the weather wasn't <laughs> real good, but, um, so this, some of this was based on that night looking through the 32 and the 28. And, um, then I used some of my other sketches and I just tried to keep it real simple and more of a sketch than a, a photorealistic type rendition. And um, so this is funny because the story behind this one was I saw, as you know, the Baylock, the original Star Trek from the Carbonite. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> and, and when I saw the colors, and you know, as a kid, that that color and the dimension, the way they lit it, and it's art. It's art. So I, I really responded to it at a young age. Hmm. The puppet, it's amazing. I should get one. Um, mm -hmm. But the colors, you know, it had the colors of Orion in it, but a little more pronounced. So that's what I, you know, used as a kind of a color palette. And, you know, exactly what I saw using um, the H beta filter. Yeah. One of those gives you a complete different view of Orion, like you've never seen it. It shows you different clouds and structure. And it's like something you've never seen. You should try it. Yeah. Um, and then and, also and I use oh, all so. of you that have never tried drawing uh, an object like Orion. You should try that, too, because you're going to become more familiar, more intimate with it. You're going to see stuff that you didn't think that you saw, you know, and all you have to do is when, once you're once you get into drawing it and spending more time at the eyepiece, go to a photograph and look at it and you'll go, wow, I got that. I really saw that. OK. But you just stay stay at the eyepiece, draw as you're going along, and um, you know when when you're at a star party. So I do a lot of you know I always turn mine over to the public because really, for me, outreach is is the ultimate goal, and um, showing kids and people like I I showed a, a mom and two boys. You know, they didn't even ever really see the ring. They've heard of it, but they saw the two stars in the central ring. So to hear these people say that, and because they were real passionate and, and um, intrigued by the hobby, so they were focused and, and they sure. really tried to look and see. And then other people just go, oh, that fuzzy thing? That that's Yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you haven't seen it. And so, you know, when you right. really concentrate your eye and, and your passionate about this you know and you spend the time you know and let your d eyes dark adapt too because you know you got to get your eyes adapted because light straight light will blow your view on some of these faint objects 
Sure. And then, um, man, when you see the detail and then you're like, wow, I really see it. It's like Saturn. It's just next level. It's almost not real, you know, but it is, it's actually there. And, um, you know, that's what I love. The kids just really love that. And, um, you know, I showed them how to use their phones a little bit to do some shots and all these people were taking pictures and it was just great. So that's yeah, awesome. it, it's always fun to, to share the view. And, you know, when you have the big scope, they come running, you know, yes, they do. <laughs> you have to go, Whoa, please don't, I don't want them to fall in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. This is uh. so these are the ones I've been, you know, working on recently. Well, John, and, thank um, you. Thank you for showing this and sharing with thank us you. Uh, and come back to global star party and oh, uh, yeah. to I'm share more here. about uh, some of the technique and all the rest of it. And let's, let's kind of take them into the world of, uh, of sketching at the eyepiece. I think that's going to be, oh. an important yeah, it, it would be great to do that. And you okay. know, it's so easy to do if you just try and every time yep. you do it, you get a little better and then you really, see a lot more at the eyepiece too so that's right that's right john thanks right. very much just try to stay dry out there oh yeah it, it actually cleared but um everything's frozen now so frozen um yeah it's like permafrosted in the mornings oh. after the the rain so it's really it's california crisp. right i mean yeah southern california no, it does california. it does get cold in the morning there it can and, and you can, um, we'll see ice okay. and and it turns white on the rooftops and mm -hmm. the lawns out there too so yeah it, it was um, a nice change with the beautiful blue sky and in the crystal clear air it was amazing that's great that is great john right, thanks everyone. so much man thank we'll you we'll see you soon okay thank you so much it was a pleasure yep thanks a Have lot a great evening all, all right. right we will we will. Okay, so we are now going to go to Adrian Bradley. Um, yep. uh, Adrian has uh, been bowling, and um, yep. uh, you know, so he fit. He's got this. Adrian's a dynamic guy. He's got his. He's got baseball. He's got bowling. He's he's a great the, birding uh, photographer. Yeah, bird. I need and, to go uh, back to doing some of that. How well yeah. can you hear me, Scott, by the way? Because I'm using... Uh, we hear you five by five. It's all good. Very good. Yep. 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 This is a, a Mac laptop that um, we've had for a while. Um, my wife was able to get her a brand new updated model. So guess who gets to get the hand-me-down? Oh, but yeah, it works, but, it's fine. Yeah, they do. Yep. They do. That's great. Yep. So we're so, at the... Uh, are we at the bowling alley right now? We're at the bowling alley. We're in the uh, lounge. So we're... <laughs> The uh, league just ended, and I ended up <clears> with a, about a 580 or something that I shot today. Oh, wow. Um, a couple 200s and a 188. And missed two You're spins. a good bowler. Um, well, I tried <laughs> to be consistent. I was consistently not throwing strikes. But that's okay. It's league. It's fun. You yeah. Know, if anything, if you, if you do a couple of things out there, make sure you enjoy them, um, and then make sure, sure – you get back so that you can um, present in Global Star Party, no matter where you are. So I'm <laughs> you are committed. Center. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Using the Bowling Center's internet, and I am going to share my screen. What I'll do, John, you, <laughs> I caught the tail end of your um, drawings, and they're beautiful. They're absolutely Adrian. Uh, nice to see you, man. You look like you've been training, dude. You're filled my whole screen with your neck and well, shoulders. That's just I a that's an optical illusion. Oh. If I move the camera further down, you'll see a spare tire. Will you uh, send me that filter? I need to get looking like you, man. Well, <laughs> they do sell the beers here, so I can send you a couple. You'll fill, out. you'll fill out if you drink some of this stuff back here. Yeah. yeah I, I watched a few of your presentations, and, man, your work is amazing. It's uh, the way you compose the, the foreground and the Milky Ways and those scenes, uh, I see those a lot, you know, and, yeah. uh, but not not like they look in yours. Yours are like magical the way you yeah. turn them on. Well, that, it's great. Yeah, I'm I'm having to set up system preferences, okay. so it, it may take a little bit of time. Um, 
how creative at the bowling alley too, dude, you're a dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you gotta be able to do I it. that. I love it. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll share soon. I gotta, let me try share screen again. Oh yeah. You have to go into system preferences and let it share. Yeah. So open system preference. Yeah. I just learned a lot. The lot. Yeah. The iPad, Allow the you know. apps to record the contents of your screen. Um, click the oh, I gotta click the lock. That's right, it's the I do the lock. Yep, it's probably a share oh. content. Oh. And now, and who might be able to record the contents of the screen until it's quit. So, just give me a second, look back. And when I come back, I will share my screen. This will just take a second. Yep. So let me. In the meantime, uh, Caesar is back there uh, busily uh, photo, you know, photo processing. Uh, so the last part of our program will be Caesar showing us uh, uh, the image that he made uh, down off of his balcony in Buenos Aires. So. Yes. I don't pronounce I, that correctly, do I? I'm not yes. pronounce how do you pronounce the name of your city, Caesar? Uh, sorry, the, the name of our city uh, yes. Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Aires. Oh. I, I don't I can't quite get it. <laughs> yeah, yes. Buenos I'm Aires. ruining I'm ruining the Argentinian Spanish language. So. Yes, uh, uh, really really we don't we don't speak an, in a normal way of, No, it's great. I love it. Maybe love maybe it. you are you're watching a, a lot of crazy videos of the the the, the you know the I, in, the World our, Cup the World Cup we did watch those. They yeah, were, it was, yes. It, it and was this is wild. something that is say okay and and really watching us uh, was very very interesting because it was a, a culture uh, ourselves. Oh, we are crazy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm stealing the show from you, Cesar. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Adrian. How yeah. are you? <clears throat> Doing good. And great. So here is what I want to share because I'm just well, not really being cheap, but. Yeah, I'd like to have you put this, uh, the website, adrianbradley.myportfolio.com. I've made some mm -hmm. updates to it. And most importantly, I decided to link this Google album from dusk till dawn. I okay. decided this was a good place. If I click on it, it's a good place to go to the photography that I love, um, what you're seeing here our pictures hopefully you're seeing them i, I think you guys yes are. we are okay we're, we're seeing yep. so these are all favorite pictures from the last two or three years that i've taken um you'll see a couple that have been reprocessed um this was the image that david liked right here uh -huh. um, with the and it's i think it's coming through he liked the overall composition of it. I decided take the same data and I made it a little cleaner using some processes that I use now. And so mm -hmm. it, it resembles a little more of what you would see with your eye. A little bit more natural. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little more natural. And so I started to do that. Here's some conjunction pictures here. Click on this All right, quick. And I don't know if I can zoom in. I won't, but somewhere over here, you would see Jupiter and Saturn getting closer together. This is actually a lighthouse shaped like a boat. And that's huh. the bottom of it. And that's Jupiter and Saturn, my image. That was the star that was the fifth moon, Galilean moon, if you remember. There were, uh, we called it five Galilean moons because the star happened to be in line with the other four during this conjunction and there are a couple of other moons that i was able to capture oh yeah wasn't that amazing when that happened yeah. this image um john your um work reminded me of um 
can see him still. Yeah, John, your work with the moon reminded me of this image that I took. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, here. Yeah, John, check this one out. This one's for you. You've sketched things that look like this. It Dude, is that is John. Um, it looks it is, the blue. That blue, yeah. I see that color. It is Amazing. hard to get this as an to take this with a camera. I think the technique to sketch it is probably overall a little easier than to make the it camera. is. It is easier. Yeah. This wow. was just, I haven't been able to repeat this shot. Um, even that reminds me of the view I had. It's very similar to mine. It it probably crazy. was that you know these things happen in nature and you just try and catch them. You, you do yeah. what you can, and um, yeah, that one. I wow, dude, that's to, unbelievable, man. Yeah, I gave a print out of it to my daughter for um, her past birthday, and uh, this is just advertising for. The northern part of Michigan, the Upper Peninsula. That's what it looks like. This is one of our falls in the winter. That was taken with an iPhone. Sometimes you just use the camera you have, and if what you've got in front of you looks beautiful, you go for it. You know, the the light. It, it's amazing uh, that the way you got the illumination and of the bright brighter sun with the in the shade. There's no, you know, over. You know, like the light's not spilling over. Everything's been really well uh, yeah. balanced. I'm yeah. This was lifting some shadows. Um, and I noticed the way the light reflected off of these branches. I That looked really. It's really dimensional. It, it, it has yeah. depth. It does. You're, it's kind of, it's, there's a lookout. If you look over it, this is exactly what you see. So yeah. it's, um. Yeah, it's beautiful up there. Yeah, that's there. we did a lot so of card worthy there. right uh, there. Yeah, that's where we vacationed when we were kids. Uh, we're from Chicago originally, okay. So, so we would go up to Michigan way. fishing. Yep. This is sometimes you just want stars. You, you know, we we do. A, I do a lot of Milky Way photography, and I do Milky Way that comes through here. But you know, you got the bright Mackinac Bridge. I just wanted some stars over it. There have been some beautifully composited pictures with Milky Way rising over the Mackinac Bridge and things like that. But um, sometimes I just go for I go for things that you can see naked eye or things that you can see, you know, it may be a little bit more than what you can see naked eye. So, you know, sunrise, sunset. That's why I called it dusk till dawn. You got a Milky Way shot right here. The moon's rising and it's you know, nautical twilight. So sunrise is beginning in the Milky Way. Like a couple of minutes after I took this shot, the Milky Way disappeared. You know, so sometimes it isn't just to take these bright Milky Way shots like this in the UP. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you want to take, you know, you want to get other areas of the Milky Way. And it, every single dot is a star. Um. And because of that, this is what happened when I got to to Kwamenem Falls and I was going to image at night. Clouds were here. Last vestiges of stars. Um, daybreak. It's peaceful. It's peaceful. Yep, it, it was, and it very much was peaceful. Um, I ended up staying there a little bit till the sun actually came up. Um, I know I showed those images, Global Star Party, um, last week. This one has a little bit more detail in the Milky Way. And then you see the Aurora. The two are sharing the spotlight over Lake Huron. And it was at once lucky and absolutely beautiful that I came to that lighthouse to image it because we had a fairly large storm going. Mm -hmm. so, so that all of these images are here from sunrises, sunsets, zodiacal light. You'll see quite a few where you get this glow of light at sun. If it's at sunset, you're talking spring. And if it's before sunrise, you're talking fall. Um, other concept video or shots, I think Mer Venus and Mercury may be hidden somewhere. Like, you know, this is Venus fitting in the belt of Venus. Hmm. So it's, it's just one of those things where I think that's cool to get Venus sitting in the belt of Venus. 
when we had the partial eclipse um, in July of 2021, I believe. I came out and captured some pictures of it at sunrise. <clears throat> um, even shots like this. This is something I'll bet you, John, you would sketch. Moon half covered. I, I'm going to tell you something. I swear to you, I have the same image. It, it, but it looks like a skull. I made it into a skull because it was oh, like cool. a Halloween moon. But yeah. my gosh, that is like deja vu right there. <laughs> Hey, I, when I looked at your images, I said, I've got some images I've captured that I'll bet you. Yeah, I'm drooling and, on them, man. Maybe I could use they, some of your work. <laughs> they, uh, you, you feel free to inspire. Well, I'll check with you, but they're unbelievable, man. Uh, yeah. the way you combine, and that's what I look at, too. I look at the same. I don't see the Milky Way like that because you got the that lake and there's not a lot of light pollution. I know there is, but you're really teasing it out. Those are unbelievable. Yeah. That's yeah. And, you know, you're, you're seeing it over time when you go, these are the dark sites. When you go yeah. there, this is a different side of the Milky way. It was wow. featured in sky up magazine, sky up magazine. There are people that will image the Pleiades and the California nebula and say, Oh, there's some nebulosity here. And I always tell them it's part of the Milky way. That's a dust lane coming between wow. them. You know, are those the IFNs, right? Is that what they call those? um say that again i have you know uh, mel bartles he does a lot of sketches and, and he sees from those dark sites and super fast giant aperture scopes he's seeing um what's called an ifn okay that's like new to me because yeah, i, I think of them as ldns for large dark nebula i right. haven't thought of them as ifns yeah they're filamentary uh structures you know dust and and they um circumference okay. various objects and they're everywhere um, yeah never... that, that sounds like the exact description of what you're seeing here yeah and, and yeah if i <coughs> zoomed in i don't have a wheel to zoom into this but um yeah that that's yeah, exactly that's amazing the and then all of this hydrogen alpha data that you're seeing there's old orion right here yeah, you that pretend you're seeing the witch head nebula if you look here, but I don't know if I really got it or not. But uh, you know, down here, that there's a rosette. You know, how often do you see astrophotos of the rosette? This you're is right. it in the grand scheme of this structure. This is it. Now, when folks say Milky Way season, they talk about this thing, the core, and and everything coming. We see this shape a lot. This was taken with a non modern camera. Um, first time I went to Okie Tex. And so and this was a modded camera. The dark sky, the dark clouds give it away, just how dark it is there. And, uh, you know, you'll want to go these other regions. You know, Cygnus setting just looks beautiful. And then, and then I have to come back to Michigan and you know, then I have to shoot things like this because there's nothing but clouds all the time. But I still try to I still try to work on the craft and improve. So like you'll see this. This is a shot of Orion with the winter Milky Way. There's a light pillar here. Yeah. I'm going to jump all the way. To, and then this picture of Cygnus by this tree. So keep those shots in mind. Jump all the way down. We're just going to we're just going to skip it off. That's a couple days ago. Same region in Cygnus. I was able to get more detail. And that's around this dark area, a little bit mm. of sky glow and some light pollution, just all sorts of things. And talk about Orion and the uh, Milky Way. More detail now. When I was sitting here surrounded this was a parking lot surrounded by a lot of evergreens and some other trees so you can see as as i try to evolve in what it is i'm shooting i'm trying a few different things to keep the detail of the foreground in play and the detail of the sky and just try and get them to match <clears throat> that's you know this scene the other scene that i shot from here and somewhere I think I have the, yeah. So I go and 
I'll probably close on this one. I go when it's cloudy, get an idea of the scene I want, try and predict where the Milky Way will be in the scene. But sometimes I come back and I miss. Right? I get here and it's a little late. So when I try and shoot the scene, the Milky Way's here, but it might miss. So then, you know, we've got a tree, we've got the Milky Way, and we've got what I believe to be Jupiter, um, you know, the planet over here. So I just set it up so that it borders. And because I'm using a modified camera in this shot, I get some of the uh, reddish sky glow that's present. So, so all of these images, this was, well, the comet is showing up and I am going to see if I can see if I can zoom in. Um, Cause I would love to, let's, nope. Yeah, the, the comet is here. Let me see if I've got, I've got this shot right here. This little fuzzball for those who've seen comets distant comets in the eye. Oh, yeah. That little fuzzball is Comet C 2022 E3 from the the Zwicky. Um, yeah. There's the one the everybody's comet. photographing right now. Yep. It, uh, it got bright, I think, a day or two ago. This was from uh, midnight on Martin Luther, on MLK Day, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Jr. Day in 116. I took the picture to there's this bunch of haze out there. I'll, I'll, I'll show you exactly what the, um, this is what it looked like overlooking Lake Huron, all of this haze. Yeah. Look this picture. Now, if I were to zoom in, this is Alcade. Zoom in and you'd see M51, you'd see M101, you know, you'd see some other stars and you would actually see the faint blob of that comet. I looked at it and said, I wonder if I'll get the comet if I shoot this way. You know, Sky Safari says it's over here. And lo and behold, when I shot it, I saw that faint fuzzy blob. And I said, oh, you can get the comet. So this is uh, zoomed in off of a 35 millimeter shot. Adrian, are you using a uh, clip filter H alpha on some of these uh, to get like the uh, California? Yeah, to get all of that, I'm not using a flip filter. It's just, right. it's the filter within the DSLR was actually taken out. Okay. So it enables that light to hit the sensor. Um, that's why you're seeing the North American here when I shoot at the Cygnus region at this location. And uh, I brighten this up a bit, but this was the same river, Al Sabo River, no, you're messing shooting at you know, the rising of Orion. And so for a while, we did for a straight month, we had clouds. So whenever there was a hint of stars, I would go out. And as far as Bortle zones go, um, Still with us, Adrian? I think we lost him. Possibly. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Yeah, I just got, I boot. Oh, there you go. My laptop died. <clears throat> so. so it's probably a perfect time to uh, end. Okay. <laughs> All right, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, if I can. All right. Thank you so much for coming on to Global Star Party. Uh, I had mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, you, you were on the last Global Star Party as well. And um, we broke a record for uh, viewership. We had 38,000, oh, wow. 36,000 people watch that program. So uh, awesome. just on Facebook. So that was that was great. Um, never quite had that much viewership before. Um, in aggregate, we've had many, many people uh, watch Global Star Party over the couple of years that it's been on is it, you know, been seen by uh, around a million people. So, um, so we really want to thank all the people that do uh, tune in, all the regulars that are on yeah. with us right now. Thank you, and uh, we're gonna 
we're going to wrap up uh, this Global Star Party, our 111th, with um, with a last look uh, from Cesar Brollo, uh, uh, who uh, is, uh, should ha be done with uh, the image processing of the image he made tonight. So, yes, Cesar, do you want to come back on? Yeah, I'll give it back to you. I stole it from <laughs> you, and I give it back to you now. I've got to take off, but... Um, as always, it's a pleasure. Thanks, to, Adrian. Uh, to be a part of Global Star Party. John, pleasure. Adrian, pleasure. Happy New Year. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Good seeing you, man. Yeah, I look to forward to, to see the you. next couple. I'm ready now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll get back and we'll Let's see if we can get Caesar to come back on here. All right. Yeah, thank thank so you again, right. everyone. Bye bye. See you. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we lost Caesar. So, no, he is there. But um, I tell you what, we're going to switch over to another. I have a little feature to run, and then if we can get back uh, Caesar, we'll come back on. But um, uh, thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Oh, here he is. There we go. Caesar, we are ready to bring you on. Uh, <laughs> yes, but we are processing. And okay. And uh, maybe five minutes we can talk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And okay, I, 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 I have uh, so describe. Have yeah, describe what you're doing right now as far as image processing. Oh uh, yes, and um, I choose. I, I sent you the picture of Agustin uh, because I I needed first of all the first uh, that I, I I send you, or much better I mm -hmm. made in, in the live. Uh, an integration of uh, 90, I, I took 90, sorry, I took 100, 100 um, likes of 10 seconds each mm -hmm. and um, in 400 ISO. This is the recite. Okay. Of course that as we don't have time, I don't have time in my present my presentation and I, I integrate without the darks and without the flats and without the vias. Right. I integrate I integrate only I show you the integrated uh picture of the um, Eta Carina but uh, without subtracting nothing of noise of electronic noise and or electronic current in the sensor lines and times mm -hmm. um uh well i don't talk my my i my scene was that i i don't talk i don't take flats normally ah. because in the refractors maybe the it's important the the, the taking mm -hmm. flats but you know the optics as first of all like we don't have a right and accurate polar alignment. I choose 10 seconds of exposure. And why I I I, I choose 10 seconds? What's the minimum, the maximum, sorry, the maximum time where the stars in 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 each individual take is near to be around. If you mm -hmm. have, for example, you know, maybe you you you, you don't have an accurate uh, polar alignment, and it, you feel more confident to, to use maybe 20, 25, 30 seconds, and it's okay if you have a great a great polar alignment. Over 30 seconds is is uh, start to see some drift of. Yeah. Yes, you have a dream mm -hmm. in each stars. You have a, maybe a long uh, path of of uh, each star. Um, well, as I tell um, earlier, I have the position for my EX100 mm -hmm. in my body where touch the. Sorry, that's next week. I'll I'll send you a presentation of the 
details of of, okay. uh, of the setup the pictures where the 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 triple the triple legs are putting in the in the in the oh, wall you put them in the same spot. yeah because are great ideas yeah if, it makes for a fast want, setup sure yes because yes you can get a faster setup each time yep. that you need to use the telescope when yes you, for example you touch of course that you remember don't change in the week <laughs> the, right. the position of of your altitude and azimuth polar alignment but yes. if, if you use this of course that we are talking of not um not uh, a guided picture guided, guide, guiding is another chapter that we can yes uh, yes a hair uh this telescope don't have a place for make a second telescope you know uh, oh yeah you would um, have to make a some bracket or something to put a yes, side yes. scope on maybe there. you can make a yes you need you need to choose a telescope in a sport scientific for example with metal parts to put an, an another mini guider or guider telescope yes. with a, another camera and um you know that i use it um uh, i use it on a uh, 80 millimeters uh explore scientific over the yexus 100 with a mini guide there and work totally properly or uh -huh. with three counterweights um of one kilo each hmm. uh, but it's another chapter where you have another situation and you have a help in a system a tool or in the same program P ph guide there you have in this software, do you have a helping tool to make a very accurate polar alignment mm -hmm. that work excellent and excellent with a uh, with the EXOS 100? If uh, but in this case, in this situation, we are we are using uh, the EXOS 100 with a first level telescope or entry level telescope. That is great because you need only to choose the maximum time where where your stars are around um of course that the situation of the sky here in Buenos Aires or in in my town are you know it's a mix between buildings part of the sky is the world right. the world it's amazing you get what you get <laughs> Yes, yes. Is it Are you polar aligned? Yes, yeah, he's, he's polar, polar aligned too. He's polar yes, aligned. Absolutely. Oh, let me yeah. look on the, the the where is my finger? Is Polaris? In the, in the, yes, it's not Polaris in the south. Oh yeah, it's Sigma, Sigma Octantis is around this. Okay. So it, and That's unbelievable that you can do that from your balcony with all the yes, lights. Yes, yes, yes. That's and a gift to be able to do that. <laughs> sure, yes, and it's a it's a miracle that I have clear area of my polar point because you know um, maybe it will be beside the, the, this building. But you'd have to drift. Um, probably yes, absolutely, and this is great because the the, the tools for polar alignment in the PH uh, guider are right. great in the in the Air. right area. Yes, in the right area in this area of of uh, the 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 polar the south polar. Something that <laughs> that in the in the last months was very interesting. I started to make uh to to learn. Uh, sailing, oh. uh, sailing, yachting, yet sailing, and um, something that, of course, Sextant. That, you know, yes, absolutely, yes, to guide the by level, of course, that yes, we don't we don't use uh, sextants yet because uh, the first level it, it's for you know maybe uh, I I don't remember the the the, the, the quantity of miles. 
uh, nautic miles, but but we start to talk, think, for example, it, something that is very interesting and is com connected with astronomy was that um, another people have uh, chosen the, 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 a very bad situation for very low tides. And um, for me, it was not only watch the tables, watch, sorry, the, 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 the tides uh, tables, maybe. Um, uh, and for me, it was simply the connection with the where is the sun, where is the 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 moon, and right. I chose the best the best hours to practice. I, for example, and this is the 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 connection between us. Uh, and the people told me why you choose the best the best time when <laughs> all the high tides. Because it's uh, and maybe you you uh, check the tide tables. No, <laughs> I know that it's full moon or you know new moon. It's easy <laughs> at the time, and uh, um, the connection with this with astronomy is something for every day, every single day, every every regular day. Um, the people sometimes regular people like me sometimes we don't we don't think that we have the tools to to, to think very fast uh, many different things that we have in, in 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 things about astronomy um for me it's really it's, it's fantastic that uh, i need to know which uh part of the sky it will be in what hour for example if I like to to take a picture of Orion from this side of my my apartment, of course it is impossible. It's near to the to the sun to the uh, to the morning, <laughs> you know, mm. uh, it, because it's this this one you do have the south and here do you have the west? I see. So way. you're limited to um, also certain parts of the sky will give you more rotation, uh, which makes it harder to take the the ten second yes. exposures. Yes, and, and something that that many times I talk with uh, with uh, Scott is not only for me because I have the the, the top uh, the top roof at uh, one hundred twenty six meters over sea level in the same building. It, it's it's a it's a tower, you know, and but many people told me the same. And when I explain, I explain it to the people. The people told me, okay, I bought you a telescope, but I never use it. Why? Yeah, because right. I have a part of the south. I have a part of the west. You have a part of the west. Come on, you are millionaire. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know, uh, we had a gentleman, uh, uh, his name I, will come to me, but he um, uh, lives in Singapore and yeah. he has a very, I mean, beautiful astrophotography rig. It is polar lined in his house, in his condo. Okay. And he has a, he has a window. Uh, he has a window that looks like it's about this wide by like that and all he does is he photographs what he can see through this square oh yeah this running like this night after night capture capturing more data more data more data he's in singapore and singapore is very light polluted okay but he's doing yes. narrow band imaging and uh wow his images are fantastic they're just beautiful images but he, he uh, uh, runs his telescope from the comfort of his apartment, his condo, inside of his condo, and shooting outside of a window is something I'd never really seen where I saw that kind of quality of images before. The images are stunning. So I'll have to get him back on Global Star Party sometime. Absolutely. Um, when I use, uh, of course, that... that I, I don't I, I'm happy from here 
I, I show you the, the in, in the in the end of the last year. I mm -hmm. show you the. Um, I let me let me show you the Orion picture. So, some pictures that that you know, but examples that that. Let me check. You can see the picture now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Ah, okay. Here, I change. Okay. Man, you must have a real nice sky down there. Uh, that southern stuff is amazing. You can see now? Yes. This well, is from your this is from your your patio? Uh, uh, from is from in the top room, in the top roof, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Watching uh, in, in a park. This was very very was a very very fun situation very funny situation where the the, the, the people that work in, in uh, uh, I, I don't know maybe consular or uh, no not consular uh, wow concierge 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 yes uh, he broke the key <laughs> of the the big part the big part of the top roof that is is watching to the south to the west the very high part but uh, for me it was very disappointing oh my god i i need to make a picture for for the, of course that i explained to him that okay i work for 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 a <laughs> global store party you know and i need pictures to show in the shop <laughs> <laughs> he told me, he told me uh, yes, I needed to, to smile because maybe where is the TV comes, you know. But uh, but he told me, okay, but I can I can open a a, a door for another part, a secret part hmm. that is watching to the to the east. Really, yes, and he opened a, a, a he opened a, a door. But I never, I never seen that of a beautiful balcony for all people. Yeah. Like a secret balcony, beautiful. I said, come on. <laughs> it is where it's part of the it's part of the common area. Yes. And well, I put my telescope this night, this night, and I took the picture of Orion going nice. up over the river of the Rio de la Plata. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that I made I made uh, maybe half hour of exposition. And I and we with Agustin we processed the the, the picture with pigs inside. And really I love this picture because it's from the city um show the possibilities that you have from the city to have to make a, a beautiful picture. And it's a, it's a picture full of details that really we, really I enjoy. And it's a picture where oh, maybe yeah. for, yes, it's, it, it's Orion in this It's beautiful. Yes. How do you get star diffraction with a refractor? Are you using yes, a Yes, it was not the refractor. Yes, it was a, um, this was a Richie Letier. Okay. Very great. Yes. In, uh, very, very good, uh, John, because, yes, we have the eyes to say, okay, I can see the spikes. <laughs> yes, yes. No, no, those no, are hard that. to paint. That's why. Yes. And, and I, I crop really a little. Um, you, you can understand yeah, it's it. very it's natural so, and yeah, it looks it's, it's amazing like, amazing work because the city and and it's upside down you know there sure. for us it's, and it's different absolutely and do you have orion is 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 a gray a gray nebula with a a lot of 
of layers, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a nebula so, so, um, you know, that, that show everything about that is a nebula. And this is a medium exposition. I, I saw uh, incredible pictures of Orion, but this one, to, to understand that this is a picture from, from a city, like Buenos yeah. Aires, it's that's a, incredible. It's that's amazing. Yeah, I was uh, I was really um maybe you can see I the Richie Gretier are very sensitive sensibles to to be uh, out of collimation. Yeah, the collimation is pinpoint. yes. You, I mean, your whole field. You is, can, yes, you can. It's see amazing. Out of collimation, really. No, no, no. I I optician. I very. I, I, it's, it's very a shame of, of, because um, yes, later that's why refractors sort of collimation. But you know, it's it's much. First of all, I like to enjoy the the moment, and uh, maybe next time mm -hmm. I make a, a, a great collimation for for this one and make another picture. But in the in the totally in the totally, do you have a? a a beautiful picture from the city, and of course, I am. I am uh, the, the camera today. I say three hundred fifty EOS, but it's a six hundred fifty EOS. Uh, the, the model is very old, it's, uh, and it's a camera that is. It's a reflex camera. I remove the air filter, mm -hmm. and you know it's. It's a companion for me uh, that uh, that it is great to show uh, to the people that maybe you can afford another CCD with with a cooler, uh, with a, a, a cooler CCD. But um, if if many people start start awaiting to to get the best gear, don't make anything and. The possibilities with a with a entry level and this kind of entry level uh you know uh, kind of gear like like this telescope uh you can show to the people um uh, that you can for the people can make especially kids young people make a very very interesting um, yes pictures and not only the pictures, if not the, interpre the interpretation, the note, the, the note, sorry, the conocimientos in Spanish, uh, a note, well, to know, to know. Who, Comprende. Comprender, <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, my pronunciation today. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, yes. How, what the, the pictures say, say us about. Uh, the kind of stars, uh, you know, uh, or this kind of uh, nebulas talking about an ancient times or uh, bo uh, born stars. Uh, you know, it, it's very, very interesting. The colors you captured colors. in your rendering <clears throat> are, they're just really unique to that camera and how far you've pushed the boundary to get that shot it's amazing and um the reds you have like some yellow red orange in the middle there and it really you know shows the power of those stars are burning in there you know and burning out that and that's a neat look i don't usually see that from you know a lot of the photos we get here and the colors are definitely different and and um but they're natural and very nice yes yes in our next star party in Mendoza, in in uh, in San Rafael, Mendoza, we make one star party in April, and we are sponsors. Uh, our company, Sarago, is a family business, and we are the 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 the, the, the dealer for Explore Scientific. This this is me, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, our next project in. In, in next in next April in our third party, it is make uh, three different stands or different tables 
where the people going to work in, um, about interpretation, interpretation about, uh, for example, photometry, ast uh, photometry, astrophotometry, um, spectrometry, and uh, nebulosity, uh, astrophotography, general, but with the idea to to guide to the people to to understand in in a deep in a deep uh, uh, in a deep way what each color of the stars or which uh, information of, of each picture says. This is very important. Um, because the people say, okay, my picture is very very say, okay, it's great, but if you can give uh, to the people that keep something from the third party to say, okay, I learned something about, you know, because sometimes you have people that, you know, it's very, very experimented or, or know a lot of, of astrophotography or astronomy, but sometimes you have many, many people who, that go to the third party as like the first experience. Um, it's if you give something about a notion a notion man uh, do you you can give a, a gift that is very important for these people Papa. wow great <laughs> hello <laughs> <laughs> okay well Steve, thank you very much thank you for for sharing with us and um uh you know i want to thank our audience for tuning in uh, and hanging out with us on another Tuesday night here for Global Star Party. Uh, we'll be back next week for the 112th Global Star Party and, um, uh, you know, with some more great speakers. And if there's something that you would like to contribute or, you know, you would like to uh, you know, just see on Global Star Party, certainly get in touch with me here at Explore Scientific. Uh, you can use my email at the letter S at explorescientific.com. So thanks again, and uh, thanks to all of you, and uh, you, to you, Don and Caesar. <laughs> you got you. one more thing to say? Thank you. <laughs> okay, all right, well, that's great. We will uh, we'll go ahead and sign off, and um, uh, until next time, take care. Good night. Good night, Joe. With 2022 behind us, the European Space Agency, ESA, readies itself with enthusiasm for the challenges and opportunities of 2023. Another year in which it will strive to support and realise Europe's bold ambitions in space. These ambitions and programmes do not only benefit the citizens of Europe, but also the global community. A prime example of this are the six Meteosat third-generation satellites which ESA has developed with UMETSAT. The first of this new generation weather satellites was launched at the end of 2022 and will soon deliver its first images. The MTG I-1 and its still to be launched siblings will allow for an earlier detection of storms and extreme weather events, serve to improve aviation safety and contribute to our understanding of Earth's changing climate. Monitoring our planet from space is also a task for the Copernicus Sentinel-1C satellite. This third Sentinel-1 satellite will be lifted into orbit on top of a Vega C. It will replace the Sentinel-1B and will provide day and night radar imagery of the Earth's surface, strengthening the European Union's Copernicus program, which is the most expansive Earth observation program in the world. To understand the universe and our place in it, ESA will launch two new astronomy missions in 2023. The innovative Euclid spacecraft is scheduled for launch in the summer of 2023 
and has been designed to help us understand dark matter and dark energy, two fundamental yet elusive forces governing the universe, but how we still do not fully understand. Earlier in the spring, ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE, will be launched. The spacecraft will make detailed observations of the gas giant and its three large ocean-bearing moons, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa. By studying the wider Jupiter system in depth, it could help to better understand the population of gas giants across the universe. JUICE will be launched on top of an Ariane 5 rocket, Europe's soon-to-be-retired, but until then, uncontested workhorse launcher. After its retirement, Ariane 5 is to be followed by the newly developed Ariane 6, which will make its maiden voyage later this year and for which preparations at Europe's spaceport are ongoing. Ariane 6 combines Ariane 5's reliability with a more flexible launcher configuration and more efficient assembly process. It also shares its P120C solid rocket motors with the Vega C. ESA's cost-efficient, lightweight launcher. With this varied and competitive launcher portfolio, Europe consolidates its position in the global launcher market and ensures independent access to space. 2023 will also be an important year for the new class of ESA career astronauts. In the spring, they will start their basic training, preparing them for future missions to low Earth orbit, the Moon, or even beyond. Another ESA astronaut who is training is Danish ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen. In 2015, Andreas became the first Dane in space, and later this year, he will fly to the ISS for his first long-duration mission on board the station. His arrival will re-establish European presence on the International Space Station since the departure of Samantha Cristoforetti. Andreas is also expected to be the first European to pilot a SpaceX Dragon capsule. Meanwhile, the development and testing of ESA missions will continue throughout the year, with ESA working in collaboration with institutional partners and European industry. These range from drop tests for ESA's return vehicle Space Rider to the continued development on HERA, the first probe to rendezvous with a binary asteroid system and Europe's flagship planetary defender. For human spaceflight, ESA continues to collaborate with NASA on the Artemis program, producing the crucial European service module, which supplies the Orion capsule with oxygen, water, nitrogen and power during its trip to the Moon. After a successful maiden flight for Orion and ESM-1 on the Artemis-1, ESM-2 is prepared for the next flight and ESM-3 will soon ship to the States. Another mission worth mentioning and another symbol of international cooperation is the ESA-JAXA EarthCare Cloud, Aerosol and Radiation Explorer mission. This new satellite is the most complex Earth explorer to date and will advance our understanding of the role that clouds and aerosols play in reflecting incident solar radiation back into space and trapping infrared radiation emitted from Earth's surface. It is scheduled for launch in 2024. All these missions bring together the brightest minds and the greatest skills across Europe and far beyond. To do this, ESA can rely on support of its member states. By the end of the year, another space summit will be held where, under the leadership of Director General Josef Ashbacher, ESA will continue to push towards high ambitions for space in Europe, just as it did in 2022, where the Ministerial Council in Paris rallied behind the European Space Agency with an increased budget. The plans and missions laid out by ESA at this summit 2023 might echo for years and bring a bright future for space in Europe. Thank mm -hmm. you.